Hello, I'm Tiki. I remember it, so you don't have to. No, I'm just kidding. I am Tiki. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And Santa Claus. And welcome to the first edition of List Mania in quite a while. That's right. It's the show where we love prolonging to the number one pick. My God, Dragon, how long has it been since we've done one of these? Quite some time. Very long time. Yeah, so... um. I feel like this is a very appropriate time because this week, folks, of course, we're doing it at the tail end of the week, but we're still kind of within the week time frame. This week marks the 10 year anniversary of the Nostalgia Critic. Now, folks, the Nostalgia Critic and Channel Awesome have gone through, needless to say, some ups and downs. And I think we can all agree that the site is not what it used to be. Nope. Having said that, um, I just think everyone here, uh, we've all been influenced by the Nostalgia Critic, and I think it's its kind of funny because 10 years is officially long enough to make the Nostalgia Critic, like I, like looking back on these picks that we have, I, I, yeah, I am, not, I am not saying this in any sort of ironic way, but I am nostalgic for the Nostalgia Critic. <laughs> so um, that's about the best way I could put it, folks. Um, We've got our top 11 favorite Nostalgia Critic episodes. We should emphasize that. These are personal opinions, personal picks. And, of course, uh, we're going to try and uh, our, our number 11 through 6, we're going to try and wrap up uh, as quickly as we can, treating them more as honorable mentions. And then 5 through 1, we'll get into some more detail about. Uh, now, I also want to quickly very very quickly go over some things uh that didn't quite make it onto my list um things that were kind of like outside of the rubric shall we say first of all the uh the 10 year anniversary movie specifically kick assia suburban nights the old and, anniversary stuff yeah and to boldly flee like those three in a row like it still astounds me like they're not great movies they're not even good movies well, they but were outside the parameter of what we're doing here. Yeah, these are episodes. Yeah, but, yeah. But not the event yeah. movies. You know? <laughs> yeah. But they are they are movies. And they are, you know, look, they're not good movies, but they are. I don't think they were ever intended to be good movies. They're certainly a lot of fun. You can look back on them a lot of reverence and nostalgia. I mean, in Kick Gassia, you see Spoonie and Lorcat peacefully coexisting with each other. I mean, how weird is that, given the context of everything nowadays? Um, so, I don't know, like, the like especially kick Assia and Suburban Nights. I think I think Too Boldly Flee had a lot of good ideas in it. It was just a little too stressed out. But I think kick Assia, and especially I think Suburban Nights was kind of like the, the best of the bunch in terms of that. I especially love Brad Jones as, uh, as Indiana Jones and Suburban Nights. <laughs> That'll always be classic. <laughs> Uh, um, hey, while we're getting all wistful for the past, just real quick, so I was, just, I was wondering yeah. uh, maybe if we could go like how we were first introduced in the Stouch Creek, just kind of kind of reminisce nostalgically in just the beginning of it real quick. I mean, I guess, uh, like, I I honestly, guys, I've been watching him since before the site. Like, I, I, I've been watching him since, like, review number two. So, yeah, that's wow. how I got introduced to him. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was watching him from the YouTube days. So I've been there from the very beginning, pretty much. Um, I, I mean, Dragon, I, we, we can't get into that, Dragon. I just have one or two things I want to uh, I want to mention beforehand. Huh? Um, okay, Disney Simber. Uh, again, something that's kind of like outside of the parameters, although, Dragon, it's not in your list, right? No, no, no. Again, this okay, like we're, cool. we focus on the nostalgia critic. If it has nostalgia critic, then then an episode, then it's then it's nostalgia critic. Oh, cool. None of these have nostalgia critic in the title. So, right. So Disney Simber, of course, is a uh, like that was a huge thing, you know, especially for me, like growing up, you know, like I, I shouldn't say growing up, but in my teenage years, you know, loving the nostalgia critic, loving Disney, and then them all coming together. And I still give him a lot of credit for coming up with new ways to do Disney Simber. I hope at some point he does the theme park attractions. That'd be great to do like a whole month's work worth of theme park attractions. But regardless, uh, Disney Simber, a lot of fun. Uh, also, uh, Really, really quick, I just want to give credit to his Adventure Time vlogs. Uh, not even the Avatar The Last Airbender vlogs, the Adventure Time vlogs in, in particular. Because I will say without a shadow of a doubt, those Adventure Time vlogs were the genesis for 
Tiki's Universe, the uh, cartoon vlog show we have for on So you want to be imagining her. And uh, also, one quick last thing, Greg. Do you, you don't have any uh, Nickelodeon month stuff on here, do you? No, again, it's still uh, on the Sash Critic. Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon month is Nostalgic Critic. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. I meant, yeah. I keep thinking, like, I keep thinking of individually. I keep forgetting, like, we have, like, the month groupings. Yeah, no, I, 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 don't just, I just want to highlight Nickelodeon month because it's hard to pick out one of those individual episodes because he basically did an episode on all the genres. Like, he did an episode on Nicktoons. He did an episode on the sitcoms. He did an episode on the... Uh, on Snick, I think. Yes, that's the one. Uh, that's when you said Nicktoons. I was thinking Snick, and I was like, no, yeah, that wasn't like a like in like a spe separate month, but yeah, it was a like whole. So all I can say about Nickelodeon Month is that that was like kind of the genesis for me to do Nicktoons Movie Month in the first, you know, in the first early days of the channel, and uh, that was like kind of the first thing that, for better or for worse, got attention on the channel, and it was all kind of history from there. So yeah. Okay, so yeah, obviously, as I said, I've been watching him since the very beginning. I'll get to my, uh, I'll get to the first review I saw of him in the countdown. But uh, I guess really quick, uh, Dragon, you know, Dragon Sandy and Nostalgia for the critic. Sands. Um, really, I don't remember how I started watching him. I just found him on YouTube. I thought, wow, this guy's hilarious. <laughs> started binge watching a bunch of his stuff and. Here I am. <laughs> Don't really have uh, much to say. I will say I do remember there was a period of time between when he was off of YouTube and then when he started uh, That Guy with the Glasses, where I didn't know that that guy with the glasses existed. And then I found out about that guy with the glasses, and I saw, like, oh, my God, he's got, like, he's got, like, Pokemon the first movie and Super Mario Brothers. Oh, my God, this is awesome. <laughs> And then at that point, though, there were like ten nostalgic critic episodes, and I thought that was a lot. <laughs> All right. Anyways, Dragon. Uh, for me, honestly, I, I kind of bonded to a few friends through nostalgia critic. It kind of introduced me. Well, kind of nice. really nice. I won't say introduced me. It really kind of bonded me with a, with a buddy of mine I've had for like you know a long time. Pretty much again, as long as I've known nostalgia, I pretty much have known. I really kind of befriended this guy. He's a, mm -hmm. Basically, uh. The period of which I was familiar with Nostalgia Creek, basically, you know, the guy recommended me to it after we just kind of talked pop culture, talk kind of and stuff, he just kind of pointed me to Nostalgia Creek. Same thing with, like, another friend of mine. So kind of, like, basically, one friend I, I knew back in the days of, like, maybe a few videos after kick -Ass, you know, that's, I think okay. that's... Okay, okay. Because I know kick -Ass, it was in its entire... I remember movie. being so confused when they were airing kick -Ass. <laughs> I was like, what is this? Like, the critic, it's like an M. Bison movie? What is going on here? Because I, I know uh, all of kick -Ass, you know, was was available. There might have been, like, a little bit after, like, a few videos afterwards. But I know that whole thing was out in its entirety, which I watched and then I got on DVD because that was really fun. And then okay. that basically kind of found the tradition of getting all the things on DVD even after, you know, after they are watching first. You know, never, never buy blind, folks. You always watch the content and then you... Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, regardless, you know, that kind of really kind of got me in the status critic and I watched them from the beginning. Initially starting with the episodes, of course, I have familiar movies, you know, like your, like your Batman Robins or your, your other ones, you know, various others. Yeah, you know, like, you know, of course, uh, we'll get into, I don't want to give away too many of what may be on our list here and there, but, you know. And uh, then, of course, with another friend, very much, I kind of caught up with the current stuff in the status critic. So I had someone to kind of talk over the new stuff with and, you know, it's it it vice versa. It was a... Uh, yeah, good members of nostalgia creating. Of course, I had the early days probably uh, when we had like kind of it was kind of fun and blooming, and then kind of we he had was at his peak with kind of kicky assy a little bit afterwards. And then, of course, things you know things have gotten complicated. Complicated is a really good word for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, things are complicated. Then they've changed. I think now we're kind of hitting some stability with nostalgia critics. So you know things are things are getting back. We're to hitting kind of, some stability with the nostalgia critic, but we have lost all the sense of community that 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 guy with the glasses represented in a weird way it's kind of back to the beginnings almost so it's exactly kind of like, right right <laughs> kind of really representative of the 10 years so without no, enough ruminating on the past that's what this whole top 11 list is and tiki let oh, me yeah. ask you something why top 11 because we like to go one step beyond <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> all right so i guess appropriately enough folks i have started my top 11 with a top 11 uh, my number 11 is the top 11 nostalgic mind fox. Uh, this was a very early top 11 list. I think this might have been his second top 11 list after uh, top 11 saddest nostalgic moments. 
And uh, the reason I picked this one is because this is a really early example of him kind of going off the vegan path with his humor. Like we had uh, all the all the numbers in this countdown were like random objects, like number banana, number balloon. Tell me that was funny. <laughs> um, and I don't know, like it's not like to be honest with you, I kind of top 11s are kind of hard to categorize. I knew I I knew I wanted at least one in there, and this was kind of an early one. I also really like the visuals and stuff and just kind of the interludes and bumpers. Uh, but uh, I don't know, you know, this this was just a really good mix of like freaky, freaky imagery, you know, fun, nostalgic, reminiscing. Like I said, it's hard to narrow down like the top 11s are almost kind of like a genre unto themselves. It's kind of why I don't have any of the old versus new on here because that's uh, that's another thing where it doesn't even... It, old versus new almost feels like a sideshow. Not not in a bad way, just kind of like, you know, it almost feels like a spin-off of the critic. Anyways, um, yeah, with uh with the top eleven nostalgic mind fucks, uh also I, I just really love the way he deconstructs the Willy Wonka tunnel scene. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that, that's about it. Who wants to go next? Dragon. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, by the way, just to preface this a little bit, because I don't believe that, uh, looking at it, this, this is not any of our lists here. Uh, just the with my with my list, I, I really tried to avoid episodes where I just there was like one standout gag, so we just like say, oh yeah, there's this episode, there's this one really great gag, and so I tried well, to avoid. Well, gee, that. thanks because you just spoiled about half my list. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'm just going over my <laughs> list. So. Okay. Okay. With, uh, and basically, I, I avoid like the commercial special as much as I enjoyed those. Like the first one, of course, ends with the Jack. You know, ends with the poor Jack, but with poor critic. Uh, right. so I had to... I, I'm glad you're bringing up the commercial specials because, yeah, I didn't. I I had no idea what to do with those either. Um, I was considering just lumping them all into one pick, but then I thought that'd just be like a really overpowered pick. So I was like, I I, I just don't know. But yeah, just the, after everyone knows, on the whole, the you know, commercials are fun. And again, it's for me, it would have boiled I down to the first. I honestly think the commercial that. specials are probably the most consistent content that the crit that the critic makes. It's kind of like the critics' version of the uh, Family Guy Row Two episodes or the Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors. It's like no matter how long the critic goes, like you can just keep pushing out commercial episodes forever, and they'll always be entertaining. Yeah, that's fair. And I also agree with you on the old versus new and that, yeah, I mean, it would have been great to put it on there, but, you know, it just feels, you know, it's a little outside in this. It's almost a little outside in Nostalgia Critic. So, again, there are a lot, we have 11 really Raiders excellent Raiders of the Lost Story Arc was another yeah. one. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there, again, there's so many, you have a lot of good episodes. There's at least like, over 300 to pick from, so you got to make compromises here. Right, so, right. <laughs> okay, real quick. Uh, number number 11 for me, again, I had to look for kind of my favorites and mixing the favorites with kind of or in a little bit in the best. It's a little bit of best, a lot of favorites. So, here we go. Number 11, The Good Son. Okay. Okay. Oh God. <laughs> they give you just Macaulay the Culkin. cliff notes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they remind the folks. Remember the Good Sons, the uh, the, the movie where you have uh, Macaulay Culkin as Aww. essentially a a, a, a future <laughs> serial killer. <laughs> it's a psychotic child. Definitely. <laughs> Macaulay Culkin's stuff. dark period. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so basically it's kind of a glimpse of the future, but you know. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> anyway, so it's uh it's called, it's the good son team. It's Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood's trying to kind of he's, he's oh, seen God, how that's it right, played. it is Elijah Wood. Shit. Hence one of the great gags that you know you have like the fun novelty of oh my god, young Elijah Wood and young Macaulay Culkin, how their careers differed. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, and, I don't to be fair, I don't think Elijah Wood is doing all that much better. Well, I'm saying Lord of the Rings versus the Home Alone franchise. Of course. <laughs> Anyway. It was half the Home Alone franchise, in the, if you want to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just on the whole, you know, it's it's impressively effective without Nostalgia Critic speaking. That's the main reason it's on here. I just love the notion of Nostalgia Critic. He can't speak, so he's holding up Wiley Coyote, as he, as he calls it himself, you know, Wiley Coyote uh, kind of cue cards he's holding up. You know, basically say, uh, you know, kind of say his introduction, his outro, and also throughout the thing, it's, it's you know, text on the screen. Yet it doesn't get boring. It, it, it works surprisingly, and it's, it adds to the comedy a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's basically him without in text is going over this ridiculously shocking film that kind of doesn't need any words because it's just it's so shocking. That's kind of what it, it, it feeds into it, it, it. Those two concepts kind of feed into each other kind of kind of f- so fluidly in that respect. And uh, I think the best gag is this really clever one where basically he animates like a little 
basically he says his childhood's dying after Macaulay Culkin is says, you know, like, I will F you up, man. Oh, God. <laughs> and it's a PG movie, by the way. That's the funny thing. It's a PG movie. It has, like, an F-bomb in it by its title, one of its title characters. Oh, that's great. And it's just, like, there's this great, this brilliant bit where, like, it's, it's scored just wonderfully where it's, you know, like, uh, he's, he's holding a card. He keeps flipping. I love how he flips the cards, like... And it's going, going, gone, and then basically you have like a little heart music playing. It's like this little animated heart with wings. It flies up, it's labeled childhood with a little halo. And then Zeskri gives like a Dr. Seussian little wave to it, like bye bye, without dialogue. And it's just it's <laughs> right, beautiful. Right. So the good son just okay. it's, it's endless laughs. She's like, oh man, that was so screwed up. It's so funny. All right, Sandy, okay. you're you're number eleven. Okay, my number eleven would be Eight Crazy Nights. Oh God! Okay, okay. <laughs> it's be one of my Oh God! The the, I, the the movie that killed a promising animation studio. It, uh, <laughs> because yeah, it did. Usually, you know, uh, when like stuff like AI and stuff, I I see the nostalgia critic reviews for it. I don't actually go see the movie because I don't want to waste my time with that crap. <laughs> Well, you so, might have to waste your time with I, AI in a future Spielberg month, but yeah, that's what, that's what I'm afraid. We'll cross of. that bridge when we get <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is actually one of the few movies that I actually did see after I watched the review, uh, just to get my own personal opinion on it. I have to say, it's it's the animation is 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 very very pleasant to look at. It's, it's awesome the whole animation. It is. Yeah, okay, reindeer it's, eating shit. <laughs> It's, and porta potties and just shit humor. It, the, 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 galore, so much shit. The whole thing is just incredibly awkward, and it's just like you know you have Davy and Whitey, which is probably the most. Uh, <laughs> if you if you listen closely, you can hear Tony Fichelli cry <laughs> when you talk about Eight Crazy Nights. If you listen really close, you can hear like a single tear fall from Tony Fichelli's eye. <laughs> it's it's, it's just the, the the whole thing is just it's. It's just messed up. It just it doesn't make sense. You know, there's all the product placement and you know the, all the different mascots coming to life and just how stuff all just plays in. It's just I, I think he, he he captured everything really well and 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 what I think the majority of what people the people who see it what they think and what what kind of emotions they're feeling what they're, what's going through their head. I think he right. represents that very very well. <laughs> Okay, uh, my number 10 is Dragon's Lair. Uh, this is kind of like a niche pick for me just because, honestly, one of the single most exciting moments in Nostalgia Critic is when Don Bluth came on screen. And the oh, end yeah. Of, and I just, I, I just literally, like, freaked out. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just have to have this on here as kind of like a salute to, to Doug being able to get Don freaking Bluth. Um I thought it was fake in the beginning. I thought it was just like him using like a DVD <laughs> bonus feature and like keeping it because he just was initially it was like he was just death glaring. I remember he didn't oh, move at all. Oh. He was in different pose. I thought it was like using images at first, and I thought it was he was starting to talk. Like, no, he's that can't be. <laughs> like, he's using like a bonus feature, like how to draw with Don Bluth or something. He's just, oh, he's just queuing up, and at the end we actually spoke, spoke to him. Like, oh my god, he actually got Don Bluth and by till the very end. So I mean, look, this review, it's like. It's not the most iconic or the most funny, but it's got Don freaking Bluth. And I just love how Bluth basically plays like a super villain, like forcing the critic to play his games. I also love how this is like a big redemption for Bart's Nightmare. Of course, Bart's Nightmare, like the critic did a Let's Play about a year into his career. Which did Bart's... not go well. No, it, it didn't go well at all. So um, so this is a big, like, this is a critic we're doing a video game and... What? He bombed like a kamikaze. Oh, yeah. So this is the critic doing a, a review of the video of a video game that actually goes over really well. Um, uh, and you know, I've I've tried to play this damn game in arcades, and I can't. I I just can't. I've tried. It's it's fucking impossible. So I completely understand the frustration. I also love the way that Rob is worked in in this review. Um, Rob is just the, he's such a great sort of side presence in the Nostalgia Critic episodes in general. I'll get to him more later in later stuff. But uh, anyways, especially the Lost World Jurassic Park. I have a lot to say about Rob and the Lost World. But uh, yeah, Dragon's Lair, like I said, it's not the most standout review the critic's ever done, but it's just really awesome that they got Don Bluth and that it's the critic reviewing a video game and it's not a terrible video. So yeah, awesome. Dragon's Lair. All right, uh, Dragon. Speaking okay. of Dragon. Yes, yeah, so my number 10, uh, the Star Wars Holiday Special. 
Okay, okay. <laughs> just the, okay. everyone know we all pretty much know stores. All I all I, know, all I remember about this review is how the critic makes the great point that we should be invested in the B. Arthur container. <laughs> like he makes an awesome argument that that is by far the most investing storyline in the whole thing. <laughs> the opening's great where he's where he's just running away, he's trying to get away from him. Well, there's again Rob is the cameraman done really so well here too, where he's just like. You know, he's like, yeah, I mean, I have to do it with Sarah Diamond. The camera's nodding, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> just, he's so defeated, like, uh -huh. And then, of course, the ending, the Santa Christ of it all. I want to say the introduction of Santa Christ. I think it was, yeah, I, I want to say it was. It's if it's like, if it's not the very, like, he might appear like a really short, like, little Christmas video he did. And if now not, Santa Christ is starring as a main character in a Brad Jones movie. <laughs> yep. Really? Yeah, he is, yeah. Oh, good uh, Jesus, bro. Oh, that. Oh, he's in that one. So yeah, he's the main he's in character in that. I don't know if he's the main character, but uh, I know see, he I fixes been... into it. <laughs> see, that's the thing. If it was a movie about Santa Claus, then I'd be fully invested. I'm that's pretty the... sure he's like a side character. Yeah, I, I can't guarantee he's a main player, but I mean, Santa Claus is awesome. He gives board games and, and DVD sets. It's not the love. <laughs> anyway, I just you know on the whole, everyone kind of knows you know the show is how especially the infamy of the holiday special. But uh, on the whole, what kind of sticks out to me is that this is like the go-to holiday special review when you think Star Wars holiday special. The go-to like kind of it covers everything really well. It really does cover everything in the special. Uh, you know, in in depth, it's still making it kind of light and, and funny. It's kind of like anyone's in your average Joe's reaction to the Star Wars holiday special. Mm -hmm. And then of course, just being being a Star Wars fan, like like. Half of every average show, like, you rarely you'll be pressed to find someone who's not a Star Wars fan. You're gonna find like someone's like, oh my god, there's nothing like Star Wars. Like Mark Hamill looks like a Ken doll for some reason. What's going on here? <laughs> right, right. And I why do love, we have? I, I love the design of animated Harrison Ford. Yeah, why do we have Harvey, <laughs> the great, the, the wonderful Harvey Corman dressed whip, as the whip, step stir, stir, whip. Whip stuff. Dressed as, <laughs> dress as the, the stepmother from Cinderella. Dressed oh as Lady God. Tremaine. Why? Why, I oh, ask man. you. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the Holly Special is a uh, great going to Holly Special. Yeah, it's a fun Christmas one to go to. And of course, the Santa Christ ending kind of. Yeah, it's Santa just, it's Christ. Christ. Santa Christ. <laughs> All right, Sandy, your number 10? Oh, my number 10 is uh, The Fan of the Opera. Um, okay. <laughs> this is this, uh, this is such a great one because it's a musical review. So they're they're basically they're pointing out the the, the movie's flaws, the pros and cons. In of course, this was done with uh, with shark jumping, which is honestly, guys, one of the last really great uh, shows to come out of the Channel Awesome era, in my opinion. That's true. I think they're on a bit of a hiatus right now, but uh, anyways, go ahead, Sandy. Um, I I just I honestly love. Whenever the nostalgia, when the, ever, ever uh, uh, the critic sings, because it's it's amazing. <laughs> he actually <laughs> has a legitimately really good voice. He he does he does, and it, the the whole thing with them uh, just pointing out the pros and cons with the movie, especially with making fun of Gerard Butler and his singing, uh, well, singing themselves is just I think it's hilarious, and I think it plays out wonderfully. I mean, even though they don't um, show any actual video footage from the films, or at least very little. Uh, it's still incredibly engaging. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna we'll, we'll get into that uh, the whole transition from you know mostly using clips to mostly using skits. I'm sure that'll be an yeah. interesting talking point as we go through these picks. Oh, okay, yeah. uh, my number nine guys. This is what I was talking about with my first ever nostalgia critic episode. One of the very 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 early ones. Oh boy. Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue. Marijuana, an unlawful substance used to produce artificial highs. Did Simon from Chipmunks just say marijuana? Why did Simon from Chipmunks just say marijuana? If that means that means that all the other Looney Tunes must know what drugs are. What's this? A joint? <laughs> I love oh, the timing on when, when after that line. I'm sorry, I don't mean just to interrupt. I'm saying when the minute he says that line, he's like he slaps his head. What is Bugs Bunny? What a joy it is. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a very quick review. It's like eight minutes long. Um, the way he talks about the anticipation and build up for this thing versus the way it actually comes up is perfect. 
Um, I had the exact same experience that he did watching this. I was browsing the video store. I saw the box art with like all the different cartoon characters. I got so stoked. I was like, this is better than the Rolling Stones meets the fucking Beatles. This is incredible. And like the first two minutes of that special is great. You know, it's like the Smurfs and Garfield and Alf and Bugs Bunny and Winnie the Pooh and all these fucking cartoon characters. But then, you know, the, the drug subplot sets in and it's just awful. It just goes downhill. Um, I love how the critic points out how mean-spirited everyone is in the special. Uh, let's see. You know, it, like I said, it's just, this is a perfect encapsulation of just my personal experience with this movie and as I said, this is the very first Nostalgia Critic episode I ever saw. So this set the tone very, very well for uh, for what I was in for and what the critic would evolve into over time. Of course, this review is nothing but the critic in front of a white wall and then clips. Like, there's there's no special effects. There's no, you know, it's just, it's just good editing and funny delivery on the critic's part. Uh, it's a very bare-bones review. But it's just, like, I can still watch it today and chuckle at it. I can still show my, like, I show this, like, whenever Cartoon All-Stars gets brought up to my friends, instead of uh, instead of showing them the whole short, I'll just, like, pull up the eight-minute review by the critic, and it's basically everything you need to know about it. Uh, so, yeah, just like Dragon said, a lot of really, really good timing. And as I said, it's just really personal for me as the first critic episode I ever saw. And the fact that as the nostalgic critic, he hit something that was nostalgic to me, like pretty much exactly how I remember it. So, if I'm right, that's the one they end on with uh, the original kind of death of the nostalgic critic and to boldly flee. I'd have to go back and watch that. I mean, I'm pretty sure it. I, I'm pretty sure it might be the proper first episode of the nostalgic critic because technically the first episode is Transformers. Movie, but that's honestly more of a pilot for a bum review more than anything else. Well, yeah, here's if the thing, though. It's like if it. he, I could have sworn, like, the tradition is, like, he's standing, like, kind of losing his mind like the bum. But exactly, he's sitting, exactly. He's sitting at the table, like, in the Cards and so I still, I, I could have sworn it was Cards and Ulcers, but you're right, I could be transferred. Do you want one of those, too? Yeah, yeah. Anyways, okay. Uh, Dragon, you're number, uh, number nine, number nine, number nine. Okay, number nine. Number nine, Casper. Caspa! <laughs> Drake, I don't know, man. I, I'm of the personal opinion that I think that fight's a little drawn out, and it was kind of like a... It, it was kind of like one of the first moments where the critic really went off book with his format, but I respect you for liking it. It's fine. <laughs> well, it's it's more than just the endings. They gotta, gotta of course, of course. With, with Casper, again, like a lot of my picks on here, I, I want to say, I guess starting with Casper on, well, I mean, starting with The Good Son, technically, but, you know, it's, uh, these reviews, they kind of represent some, really represent kind of the 90s, kind of the era the critics really pulling from. They're very much like, you know, a nostalgic property brought to screen and, and horrible. It's kind of like Casper's like one of those early examples of that. You know, we're, we're taking something that everyone kind of collectively knows and we're bringing it to the to the big screen it's going to go horribly wrong and that we're, we're, we're here talking about essentially and what i l really love about the review is i love the back this is one of the first times uh, the static had a really great back and forth with someone who's not even there and that's even impressive with the you know the animated cast mm -hmm. here and just you know the, the fact that we keep that throughout and it doesn't really lose momentum it's just kind of cast for there and you know we have like some fun gags that keep coming back through other reviews like time Timing, you know, we have, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we get uh, you know, timing. We get, like all these, you know, Casper beating them up here and there. And of course, it's always kind of fun when Casper uh, comes back and other things too. Like he's in the coffee maker, like really down the line back when we have like kind of I call it like the uh, the post studio days. You know, back when we have like all the well produced stuff. Right, right. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we have some clever jokes. Uh, they have some clever jokes in there, like when he's making fun of the fact that we do actually have a Ghostbuster making a cameo, and he's, he's going off there directly to get his paycheck. <laughs> he doesn't want to be there. Like all the pointless cameos, and and yes, the the ending is just, it's to uh, me the ending's great because just it's so silly. It's kind of fun, like improvisation because he's, he's yeah. I get a sense that he's in, in, improvising, which is going into the convention. He's just really nice people. At, <laughs> right, at, right. He's GMX, just like running in there. Media. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Geek Media Expo is you know Geek some M Expo something, and you know the 
you know, they're going after and they're falling to the pool. It just feels so electric in the air. That's what really jazz me. I hear you. Like, oh. I hear you. He's like in the costumes, like nostalgia creep mixed with a Ghostbuster. It's like a Ghostbuster with that tie. It's like the animated Ghostbusters. And of course, him, him using cons is like a big set piece for his reviews. It's going to be another yeah. uh, kind of reoccurring thing as we it's go just through the, these. It's a great point of genesis for that sort of stuff. That's kind of really why, like, can I get from Casper? I think I'd rewatch Casper some more than some other, some other like uh, views because again, just like, the ending's just so electric for those reasons. Anyway, cool. Okay, Sandy, your number nine. My number nine would be the Lorax. Oh uh, God. Oh I, man, they really the, fuck that one up. What, what do you mean? The 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 the, the studio. Well, no, the or, critic was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the studio. Was great, studio. but the studio really, really. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, I, I couldn't figure out. What you oh mean, man, I love the review. <laughs> um, I, I just love how the review hits on like all the over commercialization of that movie and exactly. how fucking like how hypocritical it is. Exactly. <laughs> that movie really is bad. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> the illumination of all the all. Why did they make so many wrong decisions with that movie? They, the 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 movie. The I, sad thing is, they came out like the year later and made the Peanuts movie, which was amazing. Well, then, take it. That wasn't. That was. Oh, you're right. Movie. That was Blue Sky. That was Blue. That my my bad. My bad. I mean, Blue Sky is not exactly a great movie studio outside of the Peanuts movie either. To be fair, unfortunately, yeah, they was, like the, uh, the year after the Peanuts movie, they made like Ice Age Six. So to be fair, it's kind of sad to say. And hopefully, Illumination will change their look on this. But as it stands right now, Blue Sky is the best Doctor Seuss movie with Horton Hears a Who. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I'm just saying that's a, as it stands. It it's the like, best theatrical Doctor Seuss movie. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm <laughs> Right now, again, the Illumination has three others. And that has, like, an extended anime parody in it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, sorry, Sammy, go on. Tell, tell us uh, what um, we the Lorax. Um, well, I saw both Horton Hears Who and the Lorax in the theater. Um, so, in the, with the Lorax, personally, for me, just, uh, just it, it really it lost me at the beginning, but once it got to the whole hipster... One slur thing. It just, it just, <laughs> it just no, like no, 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 no. Thank you. It's and then, ridiculous. And before the review, I had no idea that character actually had a fan base. It's just like I didn't either before uh, that review. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I think that was the first time we saw um, Hyper Fangirl. Was it this the first been. time? Yeah, I, I, think I so. thought. I thought it was like the Spider Man thing was Hyper Fangirl, but okay. Oh, I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe again, to Sandy. It could just be she's he's, she's dressed like Hyper Fangirl, and they reuse the costume when they actually make her Hyper Fangirl. There's a chance of that. That could be. I don't know. I understand a lot of stuff, stuff, so it's hard to track down where her original. So many from. characters and so many first appearances. It's hard to keep track of them all. I know. I. Uh, anyways, I again, it's 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 the same um, thing he 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 brought up in uh, the Cat in the Hat review, where it's basically just marketing and just the studio just wanted to make a quick buck. And not completely oh, ruining off of the Lorax off of the yeah. goddamn Lorax. Not completely ruining the property, but just butchering it so badly that it's going to take a very long time to recover. Just watch um, the cartoon. The cartoon is everything we ever need out of the Lorax. Exactly. Unless. <laughs> All right. I mean, of, co of, of, of course, there. Are, I think the cart the original cartoon could have could have been made better, but what they did was. What? Just, well, I'm saying if, if they made it into a full movie, you know, I mean, the, 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 the I think cartoons. the original cartoon's pretty damn perfect myself, but that's just my opinion. Well, I know, but I'm, I'm saying updating it. And I think the way, I think they had the same idea in mind, but their, I, their, uh, idea of updating is just, no, <laughs> adding just no. and just no. stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the opening of the review with the giving tree gig? Oh God! Oh man, that was a dark guy. I know. <laughs> oh my <man>. God! <laughs> oh boy, why are you doing he, this to me? Ah! Oh yeah, he. Oh, that, that's right. He he chops down the tree to make posters for the Lorax, right? Oh God. yeah. <laughs> oh, so man. cruel and unusual. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, uh, Sandy, bouncing off of Piper Fangirl, my number eight is the character that prominently features. I, it's a review that prominently features that character. Um, uh, this is both the most recent movie and the most recent review on my list. It is Mad Max Fury Road. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, yeah. Uh, guys, I, I put this on here because I think this is a great example of the critic doing a like basically a skit based review and doing it really, really well. Um, 
I'm not a fan of his reviews where he'll, you know, where he'll take a movie that's still in theaters and review them. I honestly don't really think they turn out too well. And I worst example is probably the first one, Jurassic World. That was a terrible. Yeah, that was that was yeah. really bad. Uh, but yeah, Mad Max Fury Road. It's just all the production values in that, the costumes. Uh, I honestly think they're some of the best special effects the critics ever done. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the critics not going to have CGI that's up to par with, you know, stuff in like mainstream movies or anything like that. But I think, I think for the critic style, the CGI and all the racing and everything in this movie, in, in this review, is really impressive. Uh, of course, we get the introduction of Devil Boner in this episode where and he I mean, not, it's like profane, girl. yeah I, I i don't like that guy's name but his character is a lot of fun um of course this this episode also has a lot of social satire in it as well which i really appreciate that's kind of like something the critic doesn't usually take on but um i really like the uh <laughs> the menemists in this episode because i i vividly remember when this movie came out it was like People either thought it was, like, the most feminist movie ever made or, like, the most anti-feminist movie ever made. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? The same thing kind of happened with Ghostbusters. It's like every movie, there, every year there's, like, a movie like that that just divides people. So, uh, so it was really cool to see the critic kind of, like, address the social issues and stuff like that regarding the movie. And like I said, just the production values, the, uh, I think this review had a really good pace to it. Of course, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, the movie itself, has a pace that's kind of like a Roadrunner cartoon. And I feel like the critics uh, tried to em emulate that very well, which is appropriate because one of the critics' big comedic influences is uh, the Looney Tunes. So, yeah, just altogether a very, very well-produced review. Okay, number eight, right? Yeah. Okay. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Oh, God, Okay. So of course the fact that it's entirely in rhyme is 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 impressive, and the writing is just really impressive on on the Grinch uh, review as a whole. You know, the theatrical Grinch film, of course. Um, and uh, what I, what I love is that it. Uh, I love how this you know, entirely in rhyme. We present you know. We we present you know the fact that it does have good qualities. I mean, it's not entirely negative. I like that he's presenting the argument. I love that it all pays off with this. Basically, we tie the message of you know people this theme of people liking bad and flawed movies, and tie it into kind of that that what the ending feels like, and we mimic the ending. The review is is mimicking the animated special, but we're talking about the movie, and it's kind of a fun little marriage of the two. Because you know the critic again, he's like he, he mirrors the at the, the very beginning of the animated special. You know, like and the, the critic's shoes were oh. too tight. And why why would shoes affect you know? <laughs> Problem with Mr. Screw is that his brain was two sizes too big. You know, we're we're doing it's it's such kind of a fun, clever way of like almost verbatim for the runtime of the of the animated special we're we're going through this. You cover in the bad movie, and again we kind of reach that crescendo of the Grinch's heart growing three sizes that day with the critic with the with the classic Dr. Seuss music playing of like seeing all the comments saying like and and the Grinch is uh, you know like oh you know what the movie's not good but I like it anyway it's like it's a guilty pleasure like a lot of guilty pleasure like kind of comments and he's looking through and he says and the more the the critic thought you know it's like a moment of change it just doesn't take it's completely subverted but it's uh it's, it's like the <laughs> right, idea of like right. of like I think it's a great meld of the two it's it's kind of cleverly written so on the whole it's a it's it's, it's really it's impressively done. I think out of all the, yeah, you know, it's really impressive. Out of the his Doctor Seuss reviews have always been consistently uh, consistently well done. I gotta say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. okay, um, uh, number eight, right? Yes. Yes, I have for that one. I have it. Okay. Um, and, so let's and, play the Stephen King drinking game. <laughs> of it, it's. Again, it's, this is just one he is, I think he represents so well because, of course, there are a ton of people who like it, and I like it for its use of practical effects. I love practical effects. And the, 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 the glorious Tim Curry. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, gosh yes, yes, the, the, be the best. Nice. I just love the uh, love the clip of him on the stairs, like ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Again, almost the Joker, folks. Let me remind you, almost the Joker. Right. And it's he it makes it very clear that Tim Curry is like one of like the most redeeming quality about it you know a lot of the acting is very very hokey the, uh, the, the acting from the adults especially is just most of the time just dead um 
again, it has his redeeming qualities, but it's just, it's just not very good. It's not, not very good. And it's, it's, I think that's obviously why I think a lot of people are so excited about the one that's coming out this year, right? Isn't this year or next year? I, oh, I think it's, it's this year. year. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What I thought, okay. Well, yeah, I, this, I, this, I still can't believe that that trailer is like the, it was like, it broke some kind of record. I think it was like, the most views in 24 hours or something like oh, that. They had some good kid actors in that movie that uh, I won't be watching in the theaters or anything, but I'm intrigued by like... Manet's some of the not movies. in it, is he? That'd be a perfect movie for Manet. Dylan oh, Manet. I'm sorry, Manet. You said it's yeah. Manetti. So Manet. That's oh, Manet. I'm sorry, Manetti. I'm sorry. No, Manet. no, no. Manet, Are you sure Manet, it's not Manet? Manetti, but they have... Are you sure it's not? Anyways. Let's let Sandy do talking. Sandy, go on, keep yeah. going. Uh, anyways, re- anyways, regardless of all this, um, uh, I honestly I think the, the one coming out later this year I think looks really good. I think that uh, they have uh, uh, they look like they're going to take a lot of the issues that the original had and fix them, make them better, make it a more. Um, I'll tell you what doesn't look Just, good that's coming out this year: the Dark Tower. Really? That doesn't look good to you? No, it, it, that looks like a mess to me. Fair <laughs> mind, I'm not I think that movie's going to flop hard. I think that movie's going to flop harder than The Mummy. Wow. Anyways. Oh, Sandy, I'm <laughs> sorry. Anyways, uh, point uh, point closed. The, the original isn't very good. I think the, 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 the one they're currently making is going to be a lot better. I think the critic represented the, the original's um, poor quality very, very well. Okay, uh, my number seven is... Oh, the balloon it, gag. Sorry. I'm, oh, the balloon, yes. Terrible. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Uh, my number seven is Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Sandy, of course, I... I'm sorry, Sandy. I, kind of, I, I stole this one from you because oh, no. I, I knew you would want it, but I just... I, I, I have to have it because... Guys, you guys don't even understand. You guys will never understand how into Tim Burton I was as a kid, all right? Like, I was, like, me and my sister were literally writing a fan script for a Tim Burton-directed Hunchback of Notre Dame, all right? I'm not even, like, I'm not even remotely kidding. Like, we were so up Tim Burton. Like, we, oh, my God. Like, and then uh, basically what happened with my love of Tim Burton is essentially uh, the hot topic thing happened and everyone, like, I just kind of, and, of course, his movies kind of started falling off, like, uh you know, like Sweeney Todd was good, but then you had something like Dark Shadows, which was awful. Oh, yeah. You know, Shadows. and then Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which probably had more negative uh, feedback. You know what? I've actually gone back. It and- does have a lovely scene in it, though, with Christopher Lee. There's a lovely scene with Christopher Lee at the end, though. There's a lot. I sorry, think there's, there's a, a lot, lot of Christopher Lee. Parts Christopher about Lee. It, but- okay, you know what, Dragon? It's funny about that scene. Like, I don't think that scene should be there just because of like the whole mystique of Willy Wonka and everything like that. However, I will agree with you. It's a really damn touching scene. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> like, all I, I don't personally what you agree- about the movie, but that scene. I is don't really personally lovely. agree with it from a storytelling point of view, but it is like a really. Well, uh, I don't know, guys. I honestly think that parts of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory are better than the Gene Wilder version. Like, the pacing, yeah. I think, is better. The uh, yeah. sentences are better. It's just Johnny Depp himself that's the main problem. Look, and Highmore was really good in that movie, though. We gotta give it to I mean, that was, like, back when Highmore was, like, yeah. I have Anyways. never been able to watch the, the original Charlie and Chocolate Factory with Gene Wilder, you know, full through, just oh. because it, the, I think the pacing is just... I uh, will say the pacing in that movie is, like, especially in the first, like, like once they get into the Chocolate Factory, I think that movie is just, like, on fire. Like, once Wilder enters the picture, it's like Wilder is so magnetic that you're just, oh, you know. But you I know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just, I don't want to keep leading stand the Wonka tangent, but <laughs> real, real quiz, I, I agree with you to a point, just I think Cheer, I think Cheer Up Charlie is like a hair. Uh, if we got rid of Cheer Up Charlie, I think oh, we'll fuck Cheer Up Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I think if we got rid of that, then I think the pacing problem would be solved, to be honest yeah. with you. But that's just my, my take on it. Uh, anyway, so my point is that I clearly love Tim Burden, and I have clearly fallen out of love with Tim Burden. Like, even huh. something like Big Eyes, which was supposed to be like a return to form with movie. them. I like it was decent. It just wasn't anything near the level of something like Big Fish, you know. Oh, um, Big Fish is so good. Big Fish is amazing. Anyways, oh, so Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. 
Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland is something that me and my sister were like absolutely dying to see back in that period of time when we were Why obsessed with Tim Burton. And I just vividly remember by the time the movie actually came out, it just felt like such a, like it felt so obligatory. You know what I mean? It felt like all the gears of Tim Burton's career have gotten him to this point. And of course we got Johnny Depp as the Mad Hatter. Of course we have Helena Bonham Carter as the Red Queen. <laughs> it's like, and so I just think this review just does a brilliant job. Like the Burden Land setting is just awesome. <laughs> It's it one is. of the most interesting and visually uh, and visually captivating things that critics ever done, I think. It, and of yeah, course, I, uh, I think Malcolm is kind of like the Mad Hatter type character is one of the best performances Malcolm's ever given. <laughs> and obviously the review is, you know, it, it's a great, obviously it points out like all the, all the things that are wrong with the Tim Burton Alice, but... Sandy and I can both agree the moment that makes this review is the moment where it digs into Doug's personal childhood. Yeah, and we yeah. see that corner of Doug's room with the Tim Burton shrine. Because that is just <laughs> that just hits me right in the feels. That's like exactly what you go through. You know, it was like Tim Burton used to be the man. You know what I mean? He, he used did. to just He was just, the guy. Oh my god. And he has just fallen so far to the point where it's like i don't like like miss peregrine came out last year and literally like nobody cared i didn't care you know? back in the if this is in the 90s you said tim burton's doing the x-men oh my god exactly yeah, yeah i, I tried like, try, now it's just like I, oh tim burton's doing the x-men oh i tried to i i tried <laughs> to love miss peregrine but it is I, I still haven't seen it. I tried so hard to want to see it and try to love it, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. I just like gave it like a raised eyebrow of like, you know what, maybe ten years earlier. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. So yeah, obviously I no. I just love the Alice in Wonderland review because it doesn't just do a great job of lampooning the movie. It does an awesome job of kind of like picking apart and dissecting an entire director's career. Amazing exactly. work in that regard. And, 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 and uh, just what he inspired to his audience. Mm. What he, it's amazing. Okay. So, uh, Dragon, you're number seven. Okay, my number seven. So this, to me, is, I would say, the most rewatchable of just the straight-up reviews. So okay. there's a straight-up review, Blank Check. Blank Check? I don't think I've ever actually seen this one. Okay. Well, this is an early one. Okay. Are you sure you didn't? Uh, let me... Let me okay, it's... it's let me I'll get into a little bit here. So basically, this is the opinion of a '90s. Some, I think in some of the early reviews that he did, if I hadn't actually seen the movie, I would skip the review. So that's oh, this is a truly horrible, cheesy '90s movie, Tiki. Oh my god! Okay, it's, okay. This I'm is, sure. uh, essentially, this is a match. Well, this is a match made in heaven for the nostalgia Craig. That's why it's on the list here because it's like this to me is like the this is my go-to if I'm if I'm just like saying if I'm wistfully saying you know what aside from Kick Ass I want to watch it in nostalgia Craig. I don't want to like dedicate the time of, of watching Kick Ass all over again. I want to I just want a nostalgia Craig review. Or like off the top of my head, what am I thinking? I'm thinking blank check because this one just kind of hits all the right notes in nostalgia Craig. Where you know it's a we have like again it's hitting all the '90s tropes that nostalgia Craig kind of feeds on very well. He's laying it out basically. He's laying out he's laying out the review by going through like basically doing it he's keeping track of the bland and saying this movie is, is like the blandest white bread <laughs> movie you've ever seen because it's got really cookie cutter horrible pants and I, my god if you look at this movie the parents are so horrible in this movie <laughs> the turners they shame oh man oh god wow that's fine i'm Word saying there. it's like i'm saying oh, this man. is like this is like the human <laughs> version of the turners and if you actually had real life parents that were as close to being cartoonally bad as the turners that's what you get. <laughs> but it's like a bland it's like what if the turners weren't over the top the turners were just as you know as you know horrible and, and neglectful but it was just like <laughs> bland though that's what I, these parents are I think it was a different movie he uh, he referred to this to, um, but I think the same goes for this one, where it's just a paperclip on a rice cake. It's just so bland. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And it's a uh, oh, geez. Yeah, basically, you know, he's going through like the lot, the poor logic choices left and right. You know, we got some fun runners, fun running gays, you know, with kind of the breakdown of the blandness. You know, it's like, hey, we need some, we need a, we need comic relief where we have like this limo drivers driving around. It's like, hey, we give him like kind of a, a, a comedic sidekick who's not really that funny. 
And it's uh, you know on the whole tone loke and the recurring tone loke, uh, you know tone lock and whatever the guy's name. Anyway, remember he was the the giant lizard in Fern Gully. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> and basically, he showed up in a few reviews. So he just kind of did uh-huh. voices here and there. So um, and also he the the big takeaway from the review, I guess, you know, the '90s premise is the I don't know if this the last thing I can really think of the spark any any memories in the is that it was a. Uh, the premise is a, a a kid who's just super neglected by his by his father, who's just rewarding the brothers just for like being ambitious. But they don't know how to work a computer for their business yet. The, the kid, our main guy, knows how to work a computer. That's an important detail because it's a nineties movie. Our main, our main kid. Oh, of course, we all know and, how important that is to the plot of Jurassic Park. I know. That's what I'm saying, Tiki. Because of that, this essentially is that as a movie. Oh man, I kid I'm a you hacker. Not. <laughs> and it's the one where this this the, the older woman falls in love with this like yes, that's kid, right? Right? I, I don't know what oh. to tell you. I just I, I need to go back and watch this. But oh my god, seriously, it's just it's, it's, this it's, this kid is just he's been chastised by his father for not being ambitious. Where he's just he's like a like a like an eight year old like eight or nine year old. Kid. Okay, we're we're gonna get into territory that's like very similar to that with uh, one of my picks coming up. So okay, right, right. So just on the like the the main guy was getting yeah, what Sandy just kind of said it right there. Like, it's like he gets into why this relationship between this grown beautiful woman and this young child oh. is sick and wrong, and it's. <laughs> It is. It's and, like it, 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 climax in the review, and it's hilarious with the payoff. Oh, and this, this, this trust me. Yeah, it's blank chicks like a go-to nostalgia group. I recommend everyone. You just want to let the classic you know, nostalgia group down the desk, just kind of going over uh, cuts oh, to the movie clips. This is like the one to go to. Blank check, everyone. Like if you want just a '90s movie in the nostalgia group, blank check. Okay. Nice. Nice. Okay. Sandy, seven. Um, uh, my number seven is the Tom and Jerry the movie. <laughs> Oh, oh God. God! We've got to have money. I just—I <laughs> so vividly remember the first time I saw this piece of shit <laughs> over at a neighbor's house. Like it was like one of my mom's friends or something, and like we would watch movies like very like I vividly remember this. Uh, this house had like a, a big, like a big case of VHSs. I vividly remember they had the uh, 1989 Batman, and that's the first time I saw the uh, the bat symbol was there. And, oh, yeah. you know, we'd watch Disney movies all the time. But then one time it was like, hey, we have a new movie. We have the Tommy and Jerry movie because they have like two little kids there, too. That were the one age. time Richard Kind let us down. And uh, yeah. And I remember just being so stoked. Like they, they made a Tom and Jerry movie because that was like back at that. There is an age where it's like IPs are actually like really exciting to see yeah. turned into movies. And, and now it's just like, child. You watched it. <laughs> right. Oh man, I remember uh, Josie and the Pussycats. I was excited for. Because <laughs> and now we're seeing him on Riverdale. <laughs> Dragon, Dragon, you know that you know that uh, you know that red letter media quota. Uh, I know what that is. <laughs> that was basically me. <laughs> uh, I had Josie no idea the until the Pussycats. Nostalgia I critic. know what that is. Until the Nostalgia, I had no idea it was released the I thought it was like one of the direct video things, but oh yeah. god. Makes it even more disappointing. <laughs> anyways, anyways, so, um, so, oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm going on a huge tangent and just hijacking Sandy's thing. I apologize, Sandy. Just, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I, he got me two of five stickies all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, yeah. please go. Uh, no, it's just really quick. It's just the moment where the moment when Tom and Jerry started talking, I was like, that's over. <sighs> It's over. Fuck this movie. Like as a five year old kid, I was like, "Fuck this movie." Sandy, go ahead. I'm terrible. It's like they they they, ha- they have all these different storylines, like a little girl and her Indiana Jones father, and it's like, oh my god, this this, this old guy who's like you're perving up on this little ice cream cart. Oh, He's like, yes, oh, the ice cream cart guy. It's my favorite <laughs> gag in that movie. It's, that is, it is. Um, it's, uh, I don't know this this whole thing. It just. The movie it really it speaks for itself and you know you you see it and you know you already know because like like you said before just the fact that these characters are talking and they get along for uh about 98 percent of the movie um just it doesn't work and uh yeah he, he makes that very clear yeah and not very... only do they talk but they don't have any conflict <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> Oh, and it, like, he even pointed out, you know, how 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 big a Tom and Jerry fan he is. I mean, I am too. I love you know old, the old Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry cartoons. They're amazing. 
So I think it's just r- real, you know, spit in the face uh, to 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 the fans. He's who, done like I think he's done like more than one editorial about Tom and Jerry. Yeah, yeah, he like, did like the ending of Tom and Jerry. Uh-huh. Like, did Tom and Jerry commit suicide? <laughs> yeah, then I think he's also <laughs> done episodes just like you know the comedic brilliance of Tom and Jerry or something yeah. like that. Like he really yeah. likes Tom and Jerry. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not a popular view, but I, I always I kind of like to have some reverence for the ones where they actually team up. You know, like it's like they're they're saving the baby, the, the irresponsible baby, those types of. Oh episodes. God, Dragon! I swear to God, I was about to like go through the TV and strangle you because I thought you were about to say you had reverence for the movie. No, no, I there's good. You know, you know, like the ones where they have to team up for some reason. Usually, it's like, hey, there's like this irresponsible mother just to, or a babysitter who bans a baby, and the babies run through town. They have to yeah, I to like that, it. but they, even still, there's still like genuine conflict in there. It's like kind of like an odd couple oh, yeah. type there, thing with there, those shorts. Yeah, there is always conflict when it comes to the original Tom and Jerry cartoons. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the timing is just oh, the timing is just mm-hmm. brilliant. It's amazing. So, yeah, I have to say, wow. like you quoted it, but I think uh, I think the whole uh, we've have <laughs> I think just, that was almost kind of like that was almost kind of like a good solid like pre- uh, replacement for of course it's sort of like you know like the go to like evil person yeah exactly uh, evil and, person meme and I'm, I'm sure right. he, I'm sure he used that that video clip in the Lorax or just whenever you know you have some big oh, I'm sure he used it in the Lorax trying somewhere. to milk something <laughs> we've got to have money. Yeah. <laughs> was a missed opportunity. He never used that creepy ice cream cart gag again. Uh, it was only that one. It never came back. Uh, yeah, that, that that makes me laugh. Every I, I will go back and watch that entire review just for that, that one gag. Okay, so we're on our number six here. Um, oh my god, oh, my number six is we're back. A dinosaur story. Oh um, sweet lord, what a movie this is. Oh man. Guys, I just have so much vivid memories of watching this movie as a little kid and it messing me up, <laughs> especially once it got to the circus. Like, once it gets to the circus, that is straight up some of the darkest shit in any animated movie meant for kids, I think. Um, yeah, uh, of course, I, I love how Doug Pred- like you know, kind of puts the disclaimer at the start of this review, like, if you don't like 100... 100- Hunter S. Thompson, you'll probably hate this review. I was I one of those that. guys, to be honest. I didn't well, hate it. I was just saying I didn't get it. That's all. I just didn't get, didn't get well, it. Well, I love Hunter S. Thompson, so I and I think it's very appropriate. I honestly think the imagery and like just the whole like genuine like what the fuck nature of this movie and also some of the darker elements mix really well with something like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So. It's not a choice that you would think of right away mixing this movie with Fear and Loathing, but I think it works well, in my personal opinion. But I'll just- agree with you. I just got to tell you, that it's like it's a one, I think it's a one percenter for the number of people out there who get who get that reference. I don't think it's one percent. I well, guess it's, it's, like it's a small percent. Is, I'm I'd say maybe percent. like 25, 30 percent. I wouldn't right. say one percent. I don't know, Dragon. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is a pretty popular cult movie. I'm saying people I mean, know that, it's exactly Toby Maguire is Thompson. I think you're going to have people say, he looks kind of like the guy. I'm, I'm sure you have people out there saying, I think he looks like the guy from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Well, that, that's true. Anyways. Okay, I'm just kidding, kidding. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're back. Um, I mean, I, just, uh, just pointing out all the what-the-fuck things about this movie, like... Uh, I love how he points out the logic of the dinosaurs, like like that one moment where, you know, they have that extended musical sequence where the dinosaurs are, like, singing and dancing through New York in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and then, like, everyone is, like, with them, and then the kid, the kid's like, it's They're a real, real dinosaur. <laughs> and it's like, no <laughs> shit. <laughs> then, well, then everyone apparently, based on the word of this one girl, then takes, makes her word to be true. And they, oh my god, they're real dinosaurs, run! And I also love the moment where, uh, you know, where Screw Eyes is like drilling into like, oh, I'll, I'll let the kids free if you go, if you guys eat my brain drain. And then Drake's just like, yeah, he has a contract, you have fucking teeth! <laughs> Eat him! <laughs> oh man! I love delivery. On, I'll set the kids free. I'll set the kids free. Screw eyes, Dragon. I, I'm sure you remember this. Screw eyes was my number one. Uh, I think it was my number one non Disney animated villain. I want to say number one. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 
Remember, he has a he has a fantastically creepy demise. Oh my god, his demise is oh, it's terrifying. And remember, you felt a little bit of sympathy for a guy in his last moments. It's kind of uh -huh. impressive. Uh huh. Oh man. Oh man. And also, I love how the critic points out that uh, that Lisa Simpson and Louis's relationship comes right the fuck out of nowhere. <laughs> And yes, it's. I'm not calling her by her name in the movie. She's Lisa Simpson. Anyways, yeah. So, um, oh my God, this movie's just like it shook me to the core as a kid. I just did not know what to make of it. All right. So, number six for you, Dragon. Okay, I just want to make it clear for those folks that my number five, and number six this is like the final cut kind of territory <laughs> region here. I had to pull like a little bit of a, a little bit of a switcheroo. So, always these three are like interchangeable, to be honest. Um. Number uh, number number six. I was, about, I was about to say number five because again, it's kind of bad interchangeable. Number uh, number six, uh, the Siskel and Niebuhr tribute. Oh, that's a good one. Ah, uh, yeah, really good, really good. And again, you can see why it was almost in, in the number. It's five. so it's, well produced. It's it's really informative. It's one of those reviews where he doesn't really rely on slapstick humor or anything like that. He just kind of like tells it like it is and let and lets the content speak for itself. Exactly. I mean, honestly, this is a, I call this one a proto editorial. It's kind of what he's doing yeah, nowadays. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. And it's you can see, and what I love it's kind of communicating in this review is that you can see the personal connection to the critic, and you know, you know, a little bit beyond the critic. I'm saying focusing on you, know, kind of the critical side of Doug Walker through the critic in mm -hmm. this review. So there's a personal connection there, and the reverence he has for Roger Ebert. He actually met the guy, and importantly, after this video, the tweet. Was, uh, yeah, that's exactly the thing. He actually <laughs> how good this was. I mean, he actually got a response from Roger Ebert himself back Which is something that Dragon and I have kind of held on to because we've got a couple exciting people commenting on our reviews as well. Yeah, an Oscar nominee. Yeah, yeah, the people behind Borrowed Time. That was that was incredibly cool. By the way, they should have won the Oscar, but that's not Oh, God, now. yeah, they should have, but let's not. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, now the, the reason I really put this on the list, no, no, no the, uh, for all the reasons Tiki and I just kind of gone into a little bit here, because again, it's, it's it's really well done. It's really kind of it's nice and honest and earnest in a way. It's like oh my, it's uh, it. I, I love how it, it's. Well, so I'm going to hit with like the top five spots on, that are coming up. Um, mm -hmm. Is that I think some of the really great ones are the ones that are informative as well as funny. This one's Absolutely. informative. That's kind of why it's uh, it, it's that kind of doing both, but it's that that's not taken away from it at all. It's just this is really nice and genuine. But also uh, this uh, the reason the personal connection I have to is that this led me based on this. I I never really never knew anything about. I knew like they were the thumbs up guys. I didn't really know anything additionally about them. I kind of learned a lot about these guys oh, wow. because okay. of this. I, uh, I checked out Roger Ebert's uh, documentary, Life Itself, and I, was, I loved that thing. It was, it, was, it was great. I watched it on uh, watched it on Netflix, and I recommend it to everyone out there, Life Itself. It's based on his book, and it was uh, uh, done as a done as a documentary. It's just an excellent thing about Roger Ebert. It also covers you know, the Gene Siskel era, of course, you know, being the, you know, the, you know, the on-air TV mm -hmm. critic. So, again, yeah, uh, this tribute kind of was a gateway to other things and appreciation of, of criticism in a way. So Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, Sandy, you're number six. All right, so you have movies like the uh, like Eight Crazy Nights, which are like the best worst Christmas specials. I guess that's not really oh, a Christmas God. special, but then you have movies like uh, The Christmas Tree. Do <laughs> um, you guys remember that one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This where it's just the animation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is just I, horrible. I, the story yeah. makes no <laughs> sense. The voice acting is horrible. The the sound mixing is just atrocious. Just everything, and I, I went back and I watched that one, or at least the first, I, I watched the first section of it, the first part of it today. It's just ah, oh, it, it's just it's unbearable. <laughs> like I, I, you couldn't get me to watch that movie if if. You couldn't get me to watch the movie. It's just, it's just horrible. The critic does a good job just, of kind of like digging up obscure, really bad animated films. Like, uh, of yeah. course, he had the whole series on the animated Titanics, which is oh, so gosh. weird that that's like a genre practically. <laughs> oh, you, see, you look at these things and you think, why? Like, who made this? Like, how long did this take to make? What were they thinking? And it's just like. And he, he goes into all this kind of detail when, he, when he's talking about the film. Like, well, like, what are these people thinking? Like, wh why does this have to be so horrible? And I think that I think I think that's the one at the, where at the very end he goes into what Christmas really means to him, and he has his family in the end and everything. Because that was nice. That's I think that's one of the only ones where he actually Doug's brings his appreciation of Christmas. It. I have to say, is one of the things that led to Christmas in July. 
Yeah, yeah, he he has a love for Christmas. That is that is no uh, secret. <laughs> I, I love that. It feels kind of you know what around, the ending reminded me of because uh, Barry, it's like it's it's awesome to build that ending because he goes to kind of goes offset to the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the actors. Then he goes to Rob, and then he literally walks from the studio <laughs> right, to his right. parents. And of course, the parents say, "Who was that?" I have no idea. <laughs> 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 it wish, but it reminded me of kind of that. Uh, this bit from uh, early Freakazoid with Candle Jack, oh, and it was like you know, he just kind of breaks and goes in the Jerry Lewis mode, where he's just like kind of like this, it's, <laughs> it's telethon Jerry Lewis. He goes in the serious telethon Jerry Lewis. Says, I just want to take a moment to thank all the people here. Look, we have Ed Asner here. You know, it's, <laughs> Ed Asner and Joe Leahy, so, yeah, it's like it's it's a hilarious. And then he goes back and like being tied up in in the scenes. It's, it's kind of one of those things where you break the action. I'm a uncomfortable as the rest of them are. Like, now I'm just kind of caught off the cuff. Like, uh, I didn't really have any, a movie quote prepared, but you know, hey, good seasonal tidings. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, Tandy, go on. Go on. Oh, no, I, I, I pretty much said my piece about it. I mean, it's it's a horrible movie. It, it, it's, it says all it needs to just by, you know, watching the first five seconds, which I think he pointed out. It's just, it, it's, uh, um, it's there's really no words that can describe how 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 just unbearable it is. But he found him and he made a whole video on it. <laughs> cool. All right. So now we're getting to the top five. Um, my number five is. Oh, I hate that this exists. <laughs> the Secret of Nim Two: Timmy to the <laughs> Rescue. Oh. God damn it. Okay, look, look, Bible Goes West is an awesome Don Bluth sequel. All it right? is. It's an amazing Don Bluth sequel. I would argue that Bible Goes West, even though Don Bluth didn't have anything to do with it, is even better than an American tale. I'll vouch for that. And you know what? The Land Before Time, yeah, it's got a million sequels to it, but the second one isn't that bad. Like, the second one introduced Chomper. It's, you know, it's got some fun villains. It's, you know, it's not that bad. Oh, the secret of them. <laughs> Something just shouldn't have secrets. Oh, uh, now, Dragon, what you were talking about with bad parenting absolutely applies to the secret of them too. Because I love how the critic just dives into detail about. Does he just... love the Stouser critic? Loves Mrs. Brisby. Of course, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, Mrs. Brisby being like a fucking like, look, there she is. Okay, you happy? Yeah, fuck that movie. I'm uh, getting riled up. <laughs> <laughs> um, about with the parenting dragon is the whole like basically uh, the critic goes into great detail about how the plot of this movie is kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy where you know like all these people put Timmy up on this goddamn pedestal like you're gonna be the next Jonathan Brisby it's in the prophecy you're great you're awesome you're incredible Timmy and everyone's just like you know like we don't know what you're supposed to do but you better do it and uh <laughs> you know he goes to the he goes to the town to train and they literally have like a fucking welcome parade and and then what does that do that creates animosity with his brother that leads him to become a villain and then timmy defeats the villain and they all fucking celebrate him even though if timmy had if they hadn't put Timmy up on a pedestal the whole time, then the whole thing wouldn't have happened. Oh, God. Um, I just, like I said, I love how the critic just goes into the minutia of what a terrible idea that is, like, to put the kid up on the pedestal like that. I also absolutely, like, I love the critic's reaction to to the Eric Idol being the villain, and then, um, and then it's revealed that the villain is Martin, you know, Timmy's brother. Does this and, one have the Death Star ending? I don't. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh man. Um, like I said, I like this movie. It's like the Secret of Nim has a lot of cool lore to it. It has a lot of mythology. You could have easily done a sequel to it and had it been good. But this is just not. Um, like I said, for this review, I just think uh, I, I love the way the critic kind of uh, examines sort of the minutia of this. And, of course, it's a very personal thing for him because he's, you know, he's such a big fan of the original, as am I. I'm a huge fan of everything 80s Don Blue, even Rockadoodle. <laughs> um, uh, you know, just uh, just the mix of passion uh, mixed with the, uh, you know, kind of the dissecting of the parental, the parental 
things in this movie mixed with like just how over the top Eric Idle is. It's just a really, really fun review and just, you know, you just kind of feel critics pain along with him. You know what I mean? You're just like, all right, we're in this together. Let's see how bad this gets. <laughs> all right. That's it. All right. <laughs> Number five for me then. Yep. Well, again, bear in mind, this is a switch, folks, and the reason I kind of switched this to number five spot is because, honestly, this one, uh, oddly enough, is the most recent, but also it's the most, one that's kind of struck the most personal chord with me, so I kind of have to kind of switch it for those reasons. Uh, uh, it's an editorial. Oh. It's uh, the editorial. It's, uh, is this the best Batman movie? That was what the title of the editorial was. This is uh, about <laughs> Batman Mask here. of the of Phantasm, course. which, of course, course, I have very... <laughs> Why am I not surprised that this is on here? <laughs> All right, let the man say his say his I know. <laughs> I'll be honest, I almost when I was making the list, it kind of like occurred to me like the last one's because it was so recent, like I have, I have my list already, like uh, like I was like, <laughs> okay, well I'm already wait a minute. I, there's a disturbance of the oh, force. <laughs> <There's something missing laughs> here. And I realized how so, oh, crap. And I was like, ah, oh, I have to make, I have to cut something. I had to cut my number 11 out. Oh, Darn it. Well, what was your number 11? Why now short circuit has to go. Short circuit. Okay. Okay. So I love that scene from the, the, based on the fact that, again, it was kind of like, I, had a, I really like the second. I like when it goes over short circuit two better than one. So it's kind of half. So I got to gotta go with a little consistency. So. Anyway, uh, okay. <laughs> so I went with uh, "Is this the best Batman movie?" Because uh, honestly, the reason I really, I really you've always it. held the opinion that it's the best Batman movie. Yes, there, there's that. That's definitely the forerunner of why it's. I've always the just when this thing popped up and I saw like the thumbnail of this video for the set, I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> the Batman Mask of the Phantasm!" He's always talking about. That was he talking about. He's giving it its due because. Uh, again, uh, I don't want to go too long with it here. Basically, uh, Dragon, he is... really quick, I had a, per I had another experience that's very similar to this with uh, his Disney Simba review of the Rescuers Down Under, where he was like, "Why aren't more people talking about this? This is an incredible movie." And I'm like, "Yes, thank you. That's what I've been saying all this time." And I feel like him doing that kind of like raised the awareness of the Rescuers Down Under, at least in the Disney online fan community. Anyways, I'm sorry, Dragon. Go ahead. Yeah, I remember, folks, and reasons that, that we'll probably get into now when we finally actually talk about Phantasm, but I can't promise it's going to be anytime immediately soon, because, again, we got to get through a lot of Batman before we, get, oh, we yeah. can earn We have to earn Phantasm, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, honestly, this this the way this, such a well-constructed kind of analysis of Phantasm is kind of viewing it along the ranks of the other Batman films, including a little bit of Batman v Superman, because I think it was before uh, Batman v Superman came out, but still it kind of measured based on, like, kind of, it had some images of Affleck Batman. I think it was the end and only like a note of like, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's still it's it's relatively current. Uh, it gives it gives Phantasm to in so many ways. It's uh, it's kind of a, it rewards this the underrated nostalgic. Uh, uh, nostalgic top. He had to do a top eleven underrated nostalgic movies. And I believe Phantasm was number one. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. years later we finally get a video talking entirely about Mask of the Phantasm. It's very well laid out. It goes through all the the, the points you want to hit with Phantasm. It kind of gives a little summation of it. It doesn't spoil anything. It's uh, it's. I already know the big spoiler for that. I know you know. I'm just <laughs> saying for the folks. Again, don't spoil for the folks right, out there. Right. It's, uh, it's the. I would say it's the best of the editorials. I mean, he had a Joker one recently that was really good, but this one's still, like, at least for me personally, it's, it's the best one for, for me. Again, I always have the personal connection. It's basically Mask of the Phantasm, the analogy I always use. It's the blue meth of Batman the Animated Series. It's Batman. <laughs> it's, the it's like 100%, uh, it's like 99 to 100% perfection of Batman. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you know, I, I get vast, vast enjoyment out of it. And it's just, it really is always like it kind of puts a smile on my face when I'm watching. And think, oh boy, oh boy! And it's like it's showing it for what it truly is, and that it can stand right up to the Dark Knight, if not surpass the Dark Knight in terms of like Batman quality, because those represented the tech development of Batman. So many good things, and probably it's something I have huge nostalgic ties to as a film. So I remember watching the VHS of this thing around Christmas time, no less. So anyway, so personal, personal reasons for what it's that worst. Okay. Sandy, your number uh, five. My number five is Felix the Cat, the movie. Oh man, this is again, no this is Phantasm the Felix. It's just, it's an, again, it's another one of those movies where it's like, why does it need to exist? It's like there's no, there's no reason. And it's like he even pointed out, like you know, this is some, this is also a movie that's kind of like the Raggedy Ann and Andy and Andy movie where there's absolutely no reason for this movie to be as horrific as it is. Yeah, it, it's, it's just it's, randomly it's, horrific. To exactly. anyone who really enjoys the Felix review, I just want to say one thing. I uh, just like uh, hand a bag of Sandy's one brief mini thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ralph Garman from Hollywood Babylon. He went on a 
ridiculously awesome rant about Felix the Cat. He just hates Felix the Cat so much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He does. For a very dumb reason, but he hates Felix oh, the Cat. He gives one of his rant for like he's pulling like, an escalator out of his bag to get an apple. It was like a really short cartoon. It was like 20, like 40 seconds maybe. And he just lost. He just went off on it. And it was hysterical. Anyway, I think the actual uh, original cartoons. The original cartoon, I think. Oh. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, yeah. The, the critic pointed out, he was like, you know, this is a, a cartoon from God knows when. It, well, why this does it predates like, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, all right? Yeah. <laughs> it, well, why does it need to exist? Plus, just <laughs> everything from just to the, the floating CGI head that doesn't have proper mouth syncing with it to the, the, the magical teardrop, which bounces around on buttons and pulls levers and goes back in time. It's like, oh, what is up with these different elements? And why does the film need to be t taken in this direction? And it's, it's like, like you were saying, Tiki, it's, it's, he does a good job at digging up obscure animated films that are just mm -hmm. complete trash. And this is another great example alongside the, the Christmas tree. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's Felix the Cat, the movie. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah. And it's okay. trash. All right. So my number four, guys, is like a lot of these jokes are probably going to be fresh in your head if you've seen our commentary for this movie, but, uh, The Lost World Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh my God. Where do I even start? A yawning transition. Oh God. Uh, it's, it's just so bizarre. And I gotta say, when Goldblum points out, like, it's the movie trying to make us think that the woman is screaming at Goldblum, that's exactly what I thought as a yep. kid. <laughs> oh my god, it's Jeff Goldblum and my murdered, nearly murdered child! Ah! So, I mean, obviously, like, look, if you haven't watched the our commentary for The Lost World, hey... Go ahead and watch it, because I think that was one of our better commentaries, because uh, I really deconstructed my personal, my deep-seated personal feelings for the Lost World Jurassic Park. And that's a very it is my commentary. It is my Phantom Menace, guys. It is the movie that will never go away. No matter how hard I try to forget it, no matter how hard I want to just, like, write it off as, like, you know, like uh, Spielberg having an off day or whatever, the Lost World Jurassic Park should have been amazing and it was just shit and it's a movie that even to this day like i went back and watched it for spielberg month last month and i was i i had that like all right i'm gonna i'm just gonna turn my brain off i'm not gonna critically think about this i'm just gonna watch it and have fun watching dinosaurs for two hours and even then i was just like i, I can't I, I i can't with this movie um so many great great moments with the critic of course i think the one that we kind of ran with in the commentary was uh, Sarah, Sarah, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> um, of course, I think Rob Walker's Jeff Goldblum impression thing is one of Rob's shining bits. I love that bit. Uh, uh, you, you see, the key to doing a, a good Gold Goldblum is I, I can't do it, but you know. Uh, let's see. Of course, we have uh, the critic pointing out just, like how these characters are just making the stupidest decisions and how, like, you know, it's, I don't know. There's just so many things. There's so many jokes in it. Uh, of course, just... The oh, T-Rex. Yeah, the T-Rex. Uh, of course, uh, the doughy guy thing. <laughs> doughy guy. <laughs> Wait, did he... I, remind me, did he call him Doughy Guy in the review? And that's why you kept calling him Doughy yes, Guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's why you, I. For, <sighs> yeah, that's why I kept calling him you, Doughy oh, Guy. That's right. That's right. He told us that. Yeah. You were so. And he was the best actor in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> but I just I, Richard. Sh anyway. No, I keep going. Yeah. So, um, one of the uh, one of the bits in particular I love about this review is like where he's like, you know what? Let's play a game called Try to Be Invested. Just go <laughs> and listen to some of this dialogue and act like you give a shit. <laughs> and then it just plays a scene from like early on in the movie where like Goldblum is like, oh, I uh, I can uh, send you a letter from home. Uh, 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 uh. And then you know Julianne Moore. It's like they're all talking over each other. It's just like shut up. Shut up. <laughs> that is by far the worst part of that movie is the characters. 
And uh, of course, we have the deconstruction of Kelly's gymnastics scene. Uh, yeah. Um, I love the I love the comic timing on the Raptor, where it's like, "Hey, you, you what?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, it was a hard call between this and Jurassic Park Three. I just think this has more funny uh, funny moments all the way through. But I have to say, guys, my all time favorite nostalgia critic joke might be the talking raptor from the Jurassic Park 3 review. The whole, where the critic's like running around like, hey critic, there's something wrong with my stomach. Can you take a look at it? Oh sure. Alan! <laughs> <laughs> like, like, the raptor's like a bee, like, Alan! <laughs> the raptor just keeps popping up from all these like weird, obscure locations. He like, comes out of his drink, he comes out of like... He, like Alan! <laughs> 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 okay, but yeah, the Lost Roll, just again, a very, very, very personal, disappointing movie for me that the critic just deconstructed perfectly. All right. Dragon? All right, number four. Cat in the Hat. Oh, God. All right. So, again, oddly <laughs> enough, I think all, all the Dr. Seuss ones are on our list. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, so, uh, oh boy, oh boy. So this is the right way to, to me, with Nostalgia Critic, especially in the, where he's kind of at nowadays. And yeah, I think we're on the men now, but I'm saying for a while we had a problem where we were trying to incorporate subplots and they were feeling very non-organic. They were feeling very tacked on. They are feeling very, they're getting away the of the main review. Cat in the Hat, on, on the other hand, though, I think this is the, this is early on in that process. This is the right way to incorporate a subplot. And this is in the kind of, the, I call it the post-studio upgrade era of Nostalgia Creek. So now we have more resources. You know, he's got Malcolm and he's got uh, Rachel. We're oh, gonna, we have Rachel as, and we have a, I don't know if this is like the first one, but it's like an early one with uh, the the devil character and uh, and, and the devil's daughter. Uh, I yeah, think, was obsessed with my I think the, the review for Devil might have been the first appearance of the Devil. But. Okay, well, this is like I, I like how like, we kept those. Are, those are some of my favorite characters that they became. And I like when these guys came back, mm -hmm. and uh, and let's just say, and you know, we have a lot, like a lot of fun little little gags in here. But again, those two are I think really character. Uh, my favorite Malcolm character, I think, is I love this kind of this really cool version of the Devil. Honestly, I think he's one of my favorite <laughs> characters that Malcolm Ray plays. And uh, we also get uh, not only do we get uh, we get Peter uh, Solis here is played by Orlando, you know, uh, you know the uh, you know Malachite, uh, Malachite from uh, from Suburban Nights, for those maybe on with the Matrix looking guy, and uh, also we get the chart guys. They're, well, they're called here analysts. Oh, the chart too, guys are great. They're a great reoccurring gag. And I tell you, if if the lists were like extended to maybe like fifteen, I might have included the Suicide mm -hmm. Squad. Uh, the Suicide Squad review, because then that's to me. That to me is what the you're. Suicide saying. Squad review was a pretty damn good review. See, Tiggy, to me, days. that's that's the version that that would be my Mad Max, uh, uh, the Mad Max Fury. Uh -huh. really. That would be my example. Like that's the problem. I think the best I've ever enjoyed one of the ones where he's I like, love how they work in the Flash cameo. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's like the chart guy. The, the, you know, getting um, back to the point is like the chart guy. Has Dragon, can, I, can I just make one quick diversion? Um, because you mentioned reoccurring gags, and there's one I forgot from the Lost World. Um, he has that great gag about like, and who is the villain? Mad. And then we have this great newsreel thing, which I wish the critic would do more. Where it's like, yes, mad. Mad is the most evil thing in the world. It kills puppies, and you know, just all this exaggerated shit. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm sorry, Drake. Go on. <laughs> Well, you know, with the chart guys, just you know, the chart guys in Suicide Squad. The reason I'm big on that tangent is because I love the uh, the gag with the you know, he's he's directly kind of talking to cameras. Says, "Who's the one who keeps making like the big ring of trash in the sky plot?" You know, the big we got to stuff like a beam in the sky, <laughs> destroying the world plot. Says, is it you? He just points there. We just love Rob Walker's priceless in this moment, just looking around like, "What? What me?" <laughs> he's, just, and he's just like talking directly to him, and he blames him for the chart, and he excuses himself, and he's like, "He's like." You know, very loving. Let's say as he fetishizes the 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 openings, it's like he has like a oh the portal late Avengers fan four stick Ghostbusters. Oh, only you understand my needs. And then, of course, is the reaction. The point is, we go we go those places with shark guys, and it kind of kind of starts. If not, if it doesn't start, I want to say this is the origin of the shark guys. I want to uh -huh. say. 
regardless, like the Chark guy's funny because we keep going back to you know, we have Malcolm, we have uh, uh, by the way, it's, I love how he calls him White Chart Guy when we get to the Suicide Squad. I think we actually develop more to go from analysts to chart guys to you white chart guy. <laughs> Okay. But uh, we have like he says, if you look at the chart, because they keep trying. No, I don't care about the chart. But if you look at the chart, it's, it's they're obsessed with they're obsessed with charts and just the, ruining the the cat in the hat. That's what these guys they they live for. Just like the, they, they represent executives so well. And the, the, again, the chart guys are back for a reason because they're really good. And we get to see the uh, the, the seeds of that here. Mm-hmm. I, I love that this, and you get really get a sense of this with Nostalgia Creek, and I, I think with a lot of people, this really settles a personal score of, you know, the book versus the movie with, with Cat in the Hat, you know, it settles that score of, like, it addresses something that we, we don't really consider, we just, we're focused on the immediate hatred of the movie, we never really consider, like, the lasting damage that this thing could do to children, I really love that, that's right, the reason it's really right. high up here on the list, because this does something the Nostalgia Creek sometimes attempts and not always is successful at, but here's the best example for me, and the reason why this trumps the Grinch, is that while we do have a hilarious act break, where it's like, you know, the, the, the pinata gag, <laughs> or, you know, the, you know, easy like Sunday morning, we get the racks the the cat and the, and the balls mm-hmm. and you know these then uh, the, the leaves like very gone with the wind type style he, he walks out to the middle and sees you know the girl calls him and says uh critic where are you are you coming back i don't know girl i just I, I, what what joke could i possibly come up with i just saw <laughs> the cat you know hit, hitting the balls and he was wearing a dress on a swing set oh, and there was a unicorn yes there was a unicorn he says, well, you know, if my dad finds out that uh, you left, he's going to kill you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back. And it's, it's just, there was such great heartwarming kind of nice niceties in the, in the episode. It was, it was, there was some genuine heart to it. And at the ending, the ending is the part of the message here is that the, the message is the reason it's it's so high on my, on my list here is that you know, the message is really kind of the nostalgic. It has like some music behind it. Some people can look at it as, oh, it's a little cheesy with the music. But no, it's not cheesy. It's a really nice message to the people out there saying, you know what? Yeah, I weep for the generation that's going to grow up with this movie instead of the book here. And the book's still reaching children today. we got to go with, you know, the great source material over over this highly commercialized, like, again, this lazy, like, we're just going to put in that movie for, you know, you know quote, unquote, for kids to enjoy. We're making, you know, dirty jokes in there with the cat and the hat, you know, that the, the hat represents other things. You know, we're, we're doing all these stupid cheap gags with, with the just, you know, the cell you know, the sell things instead of just being a genuinely good story that, you know, kids can learn from, like the original Cat and Hat was intended to be. And then we have this beautiful bit of Rachel. Oh, my God. And she's, I got to tell you, she's so adorable. As this, Obviously, she's on her knees, but it's funny. And just, she's so, so adorable. It's just, it's such a beautiful moment. This is why the girl's going off to do better things. So, you know, she went off and now she's an actress. I hope things are going well for her. It's but to be fair, we got Ted. T- Tamara out of it, and I love Tamara. So. True, Tamara is also. I'm saying also, I love, love for Rachel. But the point is, Rachel has this beautiful bit where she looks up and she just like tugs on the critic's jacket. It looks so cutesy, and she has the books. Says, Mister Critic, oh God, I like your book better than the movie. Oh my God, my heart breaks every time yeah. I watch that. And then the devil's walking her off, and it's oh it's such a happy ending. That, that's the reason I can't that review is so so darn nice, and that's so high on the list. Anyway, moving on. All right, Sandy, four. Uh, Number four, I have Thomas and the Magic Railroad, which oh. I feel sparkle, that, sparkle, sparkle. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yep, and, that's and the best gig in that thing. I, I feel, <laughs> and, 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 I, I feel like from what I've seen in the in the whole nostalgia critic society, that this movie is very prominent. It's one of the ones people remember the most. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, just, just the, the the humor that comes out of it. Obviously, the films is a, the film itself is a mess. Uh, I. I know all three of us have a ton of nostalgia for it. Oh yeah, and that's that's, oh, that's, yeah. that's basically <laughs> the only reason why people like it. Um, Love that uh, brood scene. Uh, which one? You know, like he has to cut the he has to cut the line on the on the cable. Oh, the oh yeah. was hanging over. I I go nuts for that scene, man. I love that scene. Oh man, I I, I think my favorite. I so my intense favorite. and wonderful. It is, and I, I, yeah, it is. I'm not sure what my favorite part would be, but that that is a great scene. Um, oh man, just the way he is, the way he just completely destroys Alec Baldwin's performance, which is like you can't deny that 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 Baldwin is. This has got to be probably one of the hokiest performances of his <laughs> career. <laughs> He has this great gag about Baldwin where he says, "Like, oh, please, thirty round, give him, give him a, give him a show so he can, you know, he can trade his, his thinness and his dark hair, you know, basically. So he'll, he'll be overweight with gray hair, but he'll be talented and have a show." <laughs> I 
or uh, I, I, I feel it's also there's there's uh, things I, I feel like he didn't go far enough into the its backstory. Like um, there is this uh, show back in like the mid '90s called Shining Time Station, which is basically where the whole oh, I love that show back. Oh then. yeah, it's it, it's basically where where the whole uh, thing with Mister Conductor comes from, and you know the station and all that whole real world world stuff. George Carlin. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he really he was he was puzzled. He was really puzzled, and he was making fun of it. You know, it's it's this makes no sense. Why are they not freaking out with this little you know five five inch man walking around? I also <laughs> love how melodramatic Peter Fonda is in the movie, and how critic kind of dissects that. Yeah, the opening is really good. Where he thinks it's a joke. The prompt for the opening was saying Peter Fonda, Alec Baldwin, and Mara Wilson. Why is she in this? I don't know. Mara Wilson. And then and Thomas the thing. Okay, who wrote this? And it was whispered like Rob's whispering to all of this. I don't know. It's it actually it's the thing. It's just, oh, he just looks at the Thomas screen. the thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So. Uh, I, I don't know how much history he he like how much he read up on it, but. Uh, nothing's nothing can really save the movie from, from being you know the mess that it is. Of course, you know all the, the edit changes and everything. You know, of course, what Neil talked to us about before. But it's, I wish he would have done uh, read up a little bit more on it. I think it would have made a little bit more sense. Uh, but again, this uh, I feel he because there are many reviews of the film online. I think mm-hmm. he. He just hits the nail right in the head better than any of them, and does it in a very entertaining way. Obviously, because an nostalgic critic. <laughs> Anyways, that's it. Fuck yeah, sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Coach <laughs> 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 walks off. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Yeah. Remember, he makes a phone call. He's the ending on sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Okay, guys, I'm actually kind of going to do a little bit of a switcheroo myself. Basically, okay. my number two is going to say the same, but I'm going to switch around my number three and my number one. Say because, what? Because even though my number one, what used to be my number one, is more personal to me, I just think my number three just has way more production values and way more to talk about. So I'm just going to talk about my number let's just say this is like the one that like it's not the best one but it might be my favorite but i'm not going to put it at number one just because i don't think it earns that but one of the very very early reviews of the critic kind of in that time span i was talking about where like after he started that guy with the glasses and i came back to it like that was one of the reviews that i like caught up on was the wizard um there's a couple things that really stand out of course i think one like Early on in the critic style, I think one of his great things that he's just sort of abandoned uh, in his style is just kind of like like pulling random clips from the movie that kind of like exemplify his point. You know what of I mean? Of course. Right, right. Like he he has this great thing with uh, you know with like with Bo Bridges and Christian Slater like getting really close. Really uncomfortably close. You bangs the gay duo. Oh god. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah, you see the ambiguous gay duo. Yeah. Of course, you know it, I know it. The reason I love this review is fucking Lucas. Um, I just love the way that the critic just perfectly hypes up this kid. Cause <laughs> it's cause Lucas is like like the writers of the movie try so hard to make him awesome that they fail and he's not awesome but he's so lame that it kind of loops back around to being awesome again (laughs) i mean lucas is just such an enigma of course i love the editing on the power glove scene where it's like he's playing road rash and you know like doug's just like, oh 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 lucas oh no <laughs> you would dare you know he's just like so over the top and of course the the iconic line i love the power glove it's so bad <laughs> which um, does make its way into suburban nights yes 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 I honestly think if they ever did a Super Smash Brothers, like the Power Glove should essentially be the Infinity Gauntlet. There's always something just so cool about kind of a, a gauntlet. Everyone loves a gauntlet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, I, I've always wanted Syndrome's gauntlets. Those look great. I know the like, zero point energy is so cool. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the wizard, the wizard, like I said, it was going to be my number one just based on 
pure nostalgia and I love the timing and also just me and my friends used to quote the hell out of this review. Like this is one of those reviews that we just California. California especially. Yeah, that was the that was the line, Dragon. California. <laughs> that line kept coming back in other reviews. California. California. One, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of like a good. Like I said, this is like I think this is the best early critic review. And with my list, I tried to give, I tried to give kind of like a good variety of like the time span of the critic. My number one is definitely going to be what I consider to be like the peak of the critic. But we'll we'll get there when we get there. Um. You know, like I said, just, just the way that he builds up Lucas, and just I can't get over it. It's just like it's he just makes Lucas seem so lame but so awesome at the same time. And um, yeah, you know, it's like I said, I I don't think there's obviously the production values on this thing are pretty low. It's just dug in front of the white background and some clips, you know. But, but it's that's just, all he needs. Exactly, it really is just because. I, I think his editing was just so sharp in this era, in this early era, and that's really what kind of, uh, you know, just Doug's delivery mixed with the editing was really kind of what sold people on the critic to begin with, I think. And this is a perfect example of that. So, yeah, that's my number three. It's so bad. <laughs> well, funny you say that, because mine is, my, my number three pick is a lot in common with that. that okay. This is an early nostalgia critic. It's, uh, in many ways, this one to me... Does it involve a nefarious credit card? Yes, it does. Okay. Oh! <laughs> uh, Batman and Robin. So I want to make it clear, my top three are like, all really good, but they're all very different, so that's kind of why they're oh, at their... They're all very, they're all... Credit card? <laughs> All three of them are, are are different, but they're all really good. So I kind of this is like kind of like the big you know like kind of the last review. Let's say that's it's on like for these top three here. And so honestly, this one short of another one we're going to cover in our in our kind of our last kind of uh, picks here. This to me is like we hit kind of three eras of nostalgia critic here, where you know this to me is like kind of the best of early nostalgia critic, and we're going to hit kind of like later on we're going to hit like kind of the peak of nostalgia critic. Then oh well. I'm not like going to cover this in the third year, but you know, there's also kind of the modern era in the Creek, I guess. So there's a peak. There's a there's kind of a where we're at now, and there's an early. So this is the early stuff. It's 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 Nash Creek at like the early beginnings of him really being on lighting the world on fire. You know, he's a uh, we have the humor and timing. His editing is so on point. I think uh, for a long time, this was his most popular review. This might have been the first one to watch. Is based on checking him out, based on the title, you know. Uh huh. Sure, sure. Because I didn't just, I didn't start with Kick Ass. I'll, I'll still maintain to this day that Batman and Robin is a very watchable movie. <laughs> well, I would, I would <laughs> that, but you know, the the point is. I mean, it's a bad movie. It's just kind of like The Room. It's very watchably bad. I, I I've never seen it, so I can't say anything. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, my point is, yeah, this is like one of those early ones. If I if I if I didn't start with like at the beginning, like chronology, you know, not not counting Transformers because I was watching Transformers, it was me more like the bum review, so I just kind of I just switched off to the you know the Cartoon All Stars. But if it wasn't Cartoon All Stars, then I started with this. Okay, and you know because of the bad you know, going with what you're familiar with, which you, of course we've all seen Batman and Robin be kind of the go to like okay, someone's going to talk negatively about us and make it funny. Batman and Robin be the place to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the humor and the timing, we a lot of really famous jokes. And uh, additionally, uh, I love the, the anti suicide prevention, like the, the measures to just prevent himself from, like, you know, getting. Oh my God, yeah. Stuff. It has, like, the strongest <laughs> opening of a nostalgia craig. And really early on, again, he really knew his stuff in the, in the very beginning here, where it's like, you know, he's basically walking everyone through. <gasps> Well, I'm about to talk about Batman Rise, really building up, saying, you know, it's a war crime watch Batman and Robin someplace. They use it for torture in some places. Uh, and you, you know, see kind of some doctored clips. It's really funny. And then we have, uh, it was generally, uh, that's why they've removed my tie. And that's why you know, they removed it. You know, that's why they removed my tie. You know, they took my gun away. And they, 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 he takes off his glass. That's why they sanded off the edges of my glass so I don't jab it at my throat. <laughs> and then, uh, then, of course, but they didn't count on my cyanide capsule. Oh, God. <laughs> Just robbing like a, a, a eerie bloody lab coat. He's kind of stops him, and it's like. <laughs> then later on, we have this bit where it's this really was like basically in the era where like the costumes were essentially anything they could like scrap together. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we also have like the this... Velociraptor mask. I love that costume. And again, the, no, yet again, I'm a another dinosaur. Plug, another plug for the Suicide Squad thing, and we bring back your know, dinosaur rub. Uh -huh. I love dinosaur rub. <laughs> 
anyway, um, we also had this great gag. Where I remember this, and I forgot which review it was in. I was so surprised when I was rewatching it. Oh yeah, it is in Batman and Robin. We have this gag where it's uh, he he leaves the room. He puts on like a recording of like this is awful. I hate this. He's basically very 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 directly saying it was just like the, the usual nostalgia degree, like this is not good. This critically is not good. He's very, very bad right. numbers. As he replaces, he puts in his chair a, a dummy with like a cut off like a boxing <laughs> dummy head and he, he drew like with Sharpie, he drew a uh, a goatee on it and he puts the nostalgia critic hat on it, and then he leaves the room to escape. We hear like kind of like Tom and Jerry like Literal Tom and Jerry sound effects of, you know, like Tom, like, you know, screaming when he gets hit. <laughs> and it, it's, like, off to the side. Basically, you have, like, Looney Tunes type Looney Tunes where Tom and Jerry has sounds going on as he's, like, causing a ruckus and they put him back in the room. That's the idea. He's just trapped to, to do this thing. All right. <laughs> Anyways, just on the whole, it's bad around. It hits, like, so many uh, great notes like that. We have, like, some great, great gags. And, of course, the crescendo of, of the thing would be the bad credit card. A bat credit card, all right. And how he continually just loses his mind over that. And the running gag that came after that, where he just he's just shooting his gun randomly, like in the Superman review, and Link Card says, "Bad credit card, bad credit card, I'll, I'll kill, kill you, you. I'll kill it, you." It's like this is when we get that <laughs> Sam Kinison nostalgia crazy. When he, just, he yells exactly like Sam Kinison's Mr. Oh. Daffy Duck. It's like that. That's when the nostalgia crazy really always boils down to Sam Kinison meets Daffy Duck. Where he just he's really off his rocker, and just like he's just he's yelling, he's he's frustrated, and. Uh, and uh, it's the only reason it's number three, to be honest with you, is like, there's one mistake that I guess it doesn't really like, take it away from me, but it's always something to notice. And even he noticed it in the uh, the top eleven, you know, douchey mm. McNit, sorry, douchey McNit pick stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the McGregor syndrome, and also he took some unnecessary shots at Alfred and Bruce, and like the best part of Batman and Robins. That's why it's number three for me for like really petty personal reasons. Like, how dare you spit upon that beautiful scene, the one good scene in the movie with. George Clooney actually acting with with, with Michael Goff as Alfred. <laughs> He's dying. You once you insensitive. Oh, oh, you you're so talented. You're frustrating me. So anyway, move on. Okay, Sandy. Um, my number three is one probably one of the most popular nostalgia critic reviews. It's one we all know, a son of the mask. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, 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 for the record, I want to say I love the original mask so oh, much. Oh, yeah, the original. Oh, it is great. It is great. So imagine how crestfallen I was. I had to convince myself it was okay when I came out of that. That's like, you know, it's, it's it, kind it, of like a Jurassic World situation. Well, no, it was more like kind of the Phantom Menace thing. I, it wasn't Phantom Menace for me. I'm saying I had like the, when people were like, they're kind of playing it off, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see it again. I wasn't seeing it again. I was like, no, I had moments, right? It was just convincing myself. It was a fruitless effort. It didn't last long. But you know, like, it, hey. For me, you could put uh, Lost World and Phantom Menace together, and that would still be a better movie than what the set of the mask was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know well, what? Uh, I won't argue with you on that. I really won't. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's just. It's, cold bloom, like, come on. It's just. <laughs> It's just so disturbing. It's just so just. It's it's not healthy at all. <laughs> it is not healthy to watch. It. I I I am curious to as of the mental state of where it left everyone involved. It's just it's not. Uh, it's it's not. It's not good. Um, the movie's a waste of three good actors. We have Bob Hoskins, we have Alan Cummings, and we have uh, Trailer Howard, who's great on Monk, by the way. But okay, you know, I give you, years. Dragon, I give you so much credit and respect for not listing Jamie Kennedy among the good actors. I know, that's what I'm saying. There are Thank three, you. again, I Thank told you. you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, oh, my God. We, wait, <laughs> we waste three good actors in that movie, and everything else is just not good. It's just, Dragon, that oh, just like, like a big sigh of relief. <laughs> so I'm saying Bob Hoskins is actually trying his own. You know, he's always it's over the top. He's, he's like kind of he's, bringing, like, he's in this committee. It's like between like the Super Mario Brothers movie and this, it's oh man. I, I will say this about Loki though. I really do like his socks, and I like how he's in the mask logo and everything when he's when all his clothes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I say that, yeah, keep going, Sandy. I'd say yeah. I'd say the best character for me, the most redeemable fact would be Loki in the movie. Yeah. Um, it, not he's not a good character, but you know he's no. Anyways, <laughs> and it, it's it, it's of course where we get the the uh, catchphrase a family picture. <laughs> the yeah. I love the origin of that. Oh, <laughs> uh, so that it was the first time here, you, it wasn't it? 
I I I, I, I think so. I think you're right. I'm just saying because I think the colors in the mast, some of the mast style, you know, the green and the you know, the green and blue, which I think is what they keep ever going forward. So the family picture, you have like the psychotic dog trying to kill the babies. It sounds like family picture. Oh yeah, like the dog being dragged, I think by the by the baby, and like his eyes are out of his <laughs> sockets, and like they're bouncing all over. The, it's like his empty sockets, and it's like Aww. a family picture. Um, um, I'm just gonna do a quick honorable mention that didn't quite make it onto my list. Uh, Oh God! Unless it's one of you know, I'm gonna hold off just on the off chance that it's. I don't think it's one of Dragon's top two, but I don't. I'm I'm not sure, so I'll hold off. Okay. Anyways, um, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. It's, uh, yeah, I think I'd probably just be repeating myself with all the other ones I've talked about. It's basically the same thing. <laughs> all right, guys. So my number two, and this is basically number two, just just for the sake that I'm not like repeating every single list including the official one on channel awesome of the top nostalgia critic episodes uh you gotta give the room props i mean god damn <laughs> come on what an in like the room i think was honest to god the biggest impact that the nostalgia critic has ever had on pop culture because nobody really knew what that movie was before that review and now the room is infamous. I really do think the room is like the most mainstream that the critic ever got in terms of introducing people to a movie and people really just latching on to said movie. Uh, he he basically created a whole fan base for the room. And I think that I think that in itself is just reason to put this review super high up there. Of has course. Uh, well, has Tommy has, has Tommy ever thanked the critic or acknowledged him? Oh, he, well, he did. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sandy. Because, yes, Tommy Wiseau, let's just say he's had a very up-and-down relationship with the critic over oh, the years. Oh, boy. Because when, when the review first came out, like, he was pissed. And then everyone started, like... Like, basically, the critic gave Tommy Wiseau his career of, like, come to my midnight screenings and I'll be there. <laughs> you can see me and Tommy Wiseau. And, um, you know, if it weren't for the critic, like, Tommy Wiseau would not have a career like that now. So, no. um, but then Tommy Wiseau just went off the deep end and started, like, copyright striking all of the copies of The Room. Like, not just the official one uploaded to Channel Dude. Awesome. But to be it, fair, that's reportedly his people. Is it? Reportedly. His people, sure. Well, I'm saying that his when the critic... His people. Well, I'm saying the critic did his parody where he said, like, Tommy Wiseau is cool with it, but he, like, his, his, his guy was like, Mr. Wiseau's very offended. Again, I emphasize, Tommy Wiseau's people. Okay. <laughs> um, but, I mean, what can be said about the actual review? The thing I love about the review is that literally it writes itself. It's like every single moment from that movie could be a joke in a Nostalgia Critic episode without even hearing yeah. any of the critics' commentary for it. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to start. There's just so many great ones. Um, of course, I love his deconstruction of the Denny character. <laughs> You know, Denny is just... I think Denny is probably the most fascinating character in the room for me, just because of how odd it is. Kid um, can't take a hint. I know, right? I just like to watch you guys. <laughs> um, Let's see. I love... Uh, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I just... It's hard to even really talk Let's about... This. football. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to even really talk about this movie all that much because, I mean, the review, because as I said, I mean, like, I've I've talked about the movie so much, and I think the movie and the review are almost kind of, like, simultaneous with each other. Like, uh, like watching the movie is literally just an extension of watching the review. It's, it's just as funny, except, you know, except you're just getting more of it. You're getting the full thing. <laughs> build, up, build up in the setting, Tiki. That's kind of it. You can hit it with the review. What San Francisco? Well, no. Remember the uh, the the build up where everyone's like uh, throughout the review, like uh, obscure loop of like all the. Oh my god! Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Like, right. You, critic, we reviewed it. And you're like, you don't have to do it. And she's like, no. I like one of the few times I've liked obscure loop. But, yeah, <laughs> yes, I agree on that. Part. It's like critic, <laughs> don't, you don't have to. Oh, I must loop on, and then uh, I think wait, I think Link Car might have had a cameo. Uh huh. Yeah, he did. He did. Uh, this and the, the nostalgic uh, loophole. Uh -huh. This was the Doc Brown one, right? 
Yeah, that's the thing. That's like the great kind of that's how they they time travel in the future, so we'll meet the deadline. So it'll be like back before when the deadline actually counted. Back when the deadline actually fucking meant something. So it went like uh, years into the future when seahorses. Uh, I mean, here's the, the thing. Here's the thing with me in that deadline. I honestly like him doing reviews of movies from ten years ago, like two thousand seven, two thousand eight. That's like totally fine for me. I'm like totally down for that. Because it is nostalgic at this point, but I just, I don't really like when he does movies that are current, you know, like when he did like The Purge, for example, mm. something that came out like three years ago, you know, anyways, um, but yeah, with, with The Room, uh, of course, we have that great, uh, the, the future where everything's ruled by seahorses, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, just watching the movie is kind of like watching the review and, I just I, I put this so high up because as I said, this is like a benchmark moment for the critic. This is the most influential the critic ever was in terms of like changing the pop culture landscape for something. All right. And this is the thing I was dancing around, by the way, is that uh the room is the peak of nostalgic. I think I would argue that's the peak of him that is most successful. As well, my number one is the peak of nostalgic critic, in my humble oh. opinion. So well, that's right. but also I'd say like ostensibly no matter what like if I were, like kind of list like the best nostalgia critics, like if I were to do my list in terms of like you know what the, uh, I'm going by favorites, but if I were to just include like you know what critically might be the best, room might be the best. That's the thing, like a, a like a, you know, non non favoritism, you know, just like going like strictly what t critically might be the best. Might be I the also best. think the room was a critical turning point for me because remember when I mentioned earlier that I kind of skipped movies that I hadn't watched yet when he reviewed them. Well, that all changed with The Room, because I think The Room was, like, for me and a lot of other people, uh, it's kind of funny, because I think The Critic was sort of, people might crucify me for saying this, but I honestly think The Critic did in the 2000s and the 2010s what Mystery Science Theater did back in the day. Don't kill me for saying that. But The Critic, basically, he, you know, he would introduce people to these terrible, terrible movies, and much like Mystery Science Theater did for something like Trolls 2, you know, it just, uh, oh God. I'm... If, if you listen closely, you can hear Pat Oswalt getting ready for war. Right, <laughs> right. I'm sorry, I just had a really, really funny, funny thought, and then we'll move on. Um, so, the DreamWorks movie Trolls, oh, I actually, God. I actually liked it. Like, it's not great, but I, I liked it. Um, I don't think it's bad. I hope you're going somewhere with this. I am. <laughs> so when they do an inevitable Trolls 2, which there's going to definitely be a Trolls 2, we need to have a Troll 2 gag. We need to have a character say, Oh my god! <laughs> Alright. Anyways. Yeah, that's my number two. Like I said, The Room, it's... Dragon, you're right. It's, it's pretty much perfect with the critics' comic timing and everything. I just struggle talking about it myself because it's just, it's so damn synonymous with the, you know, with the actual movie, so. Okay. All right. Number two. It's a top 11. Oh. And again, these top three are almost interchangeable because they're really that good. They're all like I think three. I know what it is. They're three very kind of, again, they're three like very different types of nostalgia group. They're all very valid and very cool. So, you know, mm -hmm. Batman Robin is number three. Number two is top 11 Batman the Animated Series episodes. Called it. Called <laughs> you it. did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Me and Sandy were kind of talking before you came on. I was like, I wonder what Dragon will pick. I bet you will pick the top, the top 11 uh, Batman the Animated Series episodes. <laughs> go ahead, Dragon. Go ahead. <laughs> So uh, for me, again, the reason this one's so high up, and it's, again, it was almost my number one, based on this main reason here, is for me, it's, but again, personally, again, hence this this ranking here, it's very rewatchable to me. I, if I were to like, watch any top 11, I'm going to go to this one more than anyone else. It's, uh, it has a really, the, the Batman cow openings really good where it puts on, like, that cool-looking Keaton cow, which uh, I, I'm always so disappointed I see him in this new Batman in the Batfleck costume because he had to they destroy that poor cow. To make that, right, that's, right. he had to cut off the tops of the Keaton ears, and they had to get rid of those oh. tails. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that's, that's just sad. sad. <laughs> and that's the thing with the collector's item he has there, because they have like you know. It's kind of people. like when I uh, when I did like sprayed some of this for a gag, and then you got all like upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, guys, I gotta, anyway. I've got to like do something for you. I'll be back in like two minutes. Okay, is that okay? Just, just. Full space.
Uh, you, Sandy, you can move on to Sandy if you want. I'm just I'm just saying I'll be back. All right. Okay. I guess Dad's not holding the camcorder anymore, so our childhood's ruined now. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it's a very rewatch. Just on the whole, is to me, it's very rewatchable. I love the uh, the cowl opening where it basically goes to imp- imitates all the Batman. It's really funny. It's just really on point with the humor and the setup. Of course, the best subject is very near and dear to me with Batman animated series. The, the critics always been with that phantasm thing. He really talked about Batman the animated series way back during only two times before this. Way back with underrated uh, nostalgic movies, where number one was Mask of the Phantasm. Then uh, he did a crossover with uh, CR, uh, the guy who does like the uh, familiar faces uh, segments, and. They reviewed the two baby doll episodes from Batman, from Batman the Animated Series and New Adventures of Batman. So that's why number two on his list is Baby Doll, because he had it re- rewatched and really appreciated it. So, um, yeah. And uh, honestly, this, the, in many ways, you can see how this affects the Savage Creek. In many ways, you see, and he talked about so He actually did a commentary on this, because again, the guy likes Batman the Animated Series like you know, many people. Uh, it really shows seeds of. What nostalgia critic and mainly Doug Walker really takes away when he's when he's writing characters. He said a lot of the anniversary specials already kind of model off elements of the Batman animated series, like uh, especially with the, the number one pick, which was uh, almost got him, which is basically villain team up episodes, which is very much a lot of contrasting personalities, much like the uh, the anniversary specials, like you know contrasting like people have their own stories and they kind of meet up and they have you know again a lot of uh, you know, people are going like, to try to double cross each other every turn very much like Batman villains do, <laughs> uh, do, do constantly. And basically at the way he goes down the list, because again it's just kind of a little flash, but I wonder what he's gonna list as his best list. I know what my best you know, my top my top eleven and onward Batman episodes are I wonder what the critics are. And you know it celebrates kind of, it's a way of celebrating the brilliance of Batman the animated series. And also it uh, uh show you the the impact it had, much like with you know, why so in the room, uh, Paul Dini, and very much like Robert Ro- uh, Roger Ebert, Paul Dini liked it. He tweeted and he framed that tweet as well with uh, with the uh, Ro- Roger Ebert. Uh, uh, I see again, it's the double. It's always it's always one of my go to for it's my go to top eleven like Batman runs a almost a go to for uh, you know like classic nostalgia critics. That's that's my number two top eleven Batman animated series episode. Sandman, go on number two. Uh, I just have a question regarding yours. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, how many times has he brought up uh, Batman, Batman the animated series? Because I feel like it's kind of a yeah. I'm gonna wait for your response first. Right, just uh, just tie in that. I was oh uh, yeah, he's a uh, well, he's done two. Uh, I really he's done two episodes. He's done two things about Batman the animated series. Again, he brought up with Phantasm, and he brought up the the series specifically when he did a review with someone else. So two okay, times. so it's only only uh, you know a couple times, right? Yeah, I mean, now he's done a little bit more. I'm saying back then, when this happened, this is like the third thing he ever did talking about the animated series. Because I feel like it's the same thing with uh, with Spider-Man. I, I don't, I don't think there's only like one or two times he he touched on uh, on on the Spider-Man movies, uh, whether it be Andrew Garfield or uh, the Tobey Maguire uh, films. I know he did the uh, like the like a top eleven list or um, like the pros a pro and con video. From uh, the original trilogy, I'm not sure, but yeah, I, honestly, that's something I, I think uh, would draw a, a few more people in. I know I'd like to see that. Yeah, he did a uh, top eleven uh, dumbest Spider-Man. Yeah, that's what it was from Sam Raimi. And then he did uh, old versus new for Amazing Spider-Man, and Spider-Man one. I think that's what the old versus new was. It might have been for two. It might have been for like Spider-Man two versus Amazing Spider-Man two. Was one one of them. All right. All right, well, it would be nice to see that uh, get revived again on his channel. Anyways, uh, my, um, what was it, number two now? Yeah, um, number two. Let me find you. Uh, I have <laughs> Doug's first movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I, you, know, I, you know what's funny? I, I'm sorry, Sam, just real quick, I wanted to mention, yeah. I, I saw this one in theaters, too. I had a personal oh. connection with Doug's first movie. It was one of my early movies. What year did that come out? Two thousand three, two. Oh my God, it was either one or it could have been one or three. Hmm. Anyways, I, yeah, I know it was in, in those first early years of the. Uh, anyways, um, I I've never liked Doug. I've never liked the TV show. You know, I I love Nick Tunes, but you know there are quite a few I haven't I haven't still haven't seen Rocco being one of those. 
Doug being Doug being one I just don't like altogether. Um, but you know, with this with this one, I feel like you really see where um, critics hatred comes with this. You know, being you know from what he says, you know, getting called um, what was it, uh, Doug funny at school, poor guy. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, We're slow, and we've been building this in crescendo this review. <laughs> Oh, oh, he's hello, like, daddy, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can I hear you. He's my headphones in right now, guys. I just want to give Hipster Donald a brief candy because... Oh, boy. Hipster Donald was inspired by the Nostalgia Critic and everything like that. Yeah, yo, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh what was that, Oscar? A very brief cameo. <laughs> All right. I, I was... I uh, feel so left down right now. <laughs> <laughs> he told me he was going to bring Hipster Donald, and I didn't know when or where, so I just going with it. Anyways, no, you Honestly, know. you just reminded me, so I was like, oh, shit, that's right. I do have to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Anyways, I, I was talking about Doug's first movie. That's my number two. Doug's one. first movie. Oh yes. my god! D- Doug like, is something besides good. Besides the fact that the Nickelodeon and Disney shows are like radically different from each other, in yeah. spite of having the same characters. Yeah, it's. I mean, I I never really watched either. I've only watched a few episodes of Doug. I'm not sure whether it was. Disney I mean, look, or- the, the original Doug is pretty damn vanilla, but vanilla is a good flavor of ice cream. So you know, sometimes, like vanilla. sometimes it's good to have a nice vanilla show. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's why I've never liked it. It's just it's too vanilla, and I, was, I guess that'd be the best way to describe it. it's the vanilla child of the, the Nickelodeon family. Um, okay, if, like like between Rocco, no, I'm sorry, between Ren and Stimpy, uh, Rugrats and Doug, who was the strawberry and who was the chocolate was. I think Rugrats, Rugrats was the chocolate because Rugrats yeah. was the one that just everyone loved. And yeah, then Ren Stimpy. Strawberry was Red and Stimpy was strawberry because Ren and Stimpy's like the best one, but it's the most off kilter. Yeah, yes. I'd say Ren and Stimpy is strawberry with the strawberry chunks in it. So it's kind of like, do I like it going on? <laughs> I like that. Okay. I never uh, love. I love strawberry flavor. Like I hate the chunks. Oh, me too. Me too. I agree. I agree. I like those <laughs> chunks. <laughs> okay, we're going on about the name saying the, the the name payoff. Oh, um, yeah, just how how uh, we're talking about how you know, uh, credit could be called Doug Funny at school, and how he's just oh you know, my god, it right. just it's, okay. it's, it's, it's sparked this whole new <laughs> hatred for the for the show, and <laughs> and how um you know it's t- you know he just has his head down, and just cues the theme. <laughs> uh, great, I. Anyways, I just the whole the whole film how it just it doesn't it doesn't quite tie together the way the way I guess you you would expect. But again, it's Disney. Disney was telling me, and they I guess from what I hear, they did they didn't quite know what they had. This was like back in that weird era. Like this was around the same time as Muppets from Space, where Disney just did not know what to do with their IPs. Exactly. <laughs> I remember um, seeing that really young, seeing that movie, and it was it was just like oh god, that's. Uh... I was, th- I was still thinking of the Nickelodeon show, and I, was, I, was, I didn't quite make the connection that, oh, wait, yeah, it's the, it's the, based on the Disney Doug, which has a very, it feels like a very different show. All I remember about the Disney Doug is the fact that how much they changed Roger's character. Like, he's some sort of, like, rich kid who's supposed to be, like, pseudo-sympathetic. I, and doesn't, like, isn't there that weird subplot where they're trying to build the robot in Doug's first movie? Oh, the robot's funny in that oh movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sandy. Sandy, please be able to go on though. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I don't know the difference between the two. It seems ridiculous how Disney would, you know, change characters. It's so radically different, even though it's pretty much the same premise and same characters. But like, like, like you think? Wouldn't they? Wouldn't they think that you know? That's why fans love the show. I mean, they change it. <laughs> Anyways, let's. I think it's just Although, hilarious. To be fair, I don't think in history there's been any one person who's ever loved the Nickelodeon Doug. <laughs> well, you know, the <laughs> reason that we can't get Doug on DVD <laughs> is because of this, this change in, like, you know, because it's owned by two places. Yeah, right, right. 
that's also the reason why you will never see Doug being like resurrected on uh you know on the splat or anything like that. Darn rights issues. <laughs> All right. Um, I wish Disney would just give Doug back to Nickelodeon. Yeah. Yeah. That'll, that'll be the day. It's, Anyways, wouldn't it be great if like a hundred years from now Doug was like the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit in Disney's history? <laughs> And, like, a hundred years from now, it's, like, we'll have, like, a, a historic, like, Blu-ray box set of Doug. It's, like, they're finally <laughs> out, guys. We can rewatch watch Doug. All right, all right. Honestly, I think much like Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, it's, like, yeah, these are okay. <laughs> I mean, not to diss Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Yeah, they're okay. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're nothing special. It's, yeah, they're, they're just really like not. To... <laughs> it's just a cool kind of historical artifact. Anyway. Um, I, I think the review plays together... I, the movie does not play together nicely. The review is far more enjoyable. Just it's, it's funnier. It's it's just it just it, it all works together so nicely. Of course, you know Doug's uh, not Doug the cartoon, but you know the critics' personal mm-hmm. hatred for it. You can it very uh, shines very clearly, which is kind of ties into my next uh, my uh, option I chose for number one. So okay. that wraps up what I have to say. All right, and my number one, guys. This is what I consider to be the peak of Nostalgia Critic. This is, like, basically there there was never anything that kind of reached the same sort of height for me again after that. And I also love this review because it just showcases so nicely the sense of community that uh, that guy with the glasses had built up. And unfortunately, a big reason why this is a peak is that after this, that sense of community kind of fell apart. Like, this was kind of like in that space where Spoonie had already departed from the channel. And of course, I think historically, Spoonie departing from the channel was kind of like a big sort of like, it's almost kind of like there's pre, there's post Spoonie and uh, there's the Spoonie era and the post Spoonie era for Channel Awesome. But um, this, like, even though Spoonie had departed, I'm pretty sure Nostalgia Chick was gone at this point as well. Um, we still had a great selection of people. We had a few. I'm sorry, I should actually say what it was. Um, my number <laughs> one is the review of Lay Mr. Rob. Oh. <laughs> um, so I love, like I said, just the sense of community is exactly why I love this review. Um, you know, we have some newer personalities who are kind of taking the spotlight. Like, Pa Dugan had been on the channel for a while, but he hadn't really ever had a big crossover with a critic until then. So it was good to see Paul on there. Paul was, of course, the first, uh, I believe he was before Todd in the Shadows as the first music reviewer on the site. Um, anyways, and then we also had Kyle Calgarin who, of course, is the big sort of, like, film snob guy. He's he's kind of, like, the classy version of the cinema snob. Like, he's kind of, like, the guy who reviews movies that you would expect someone like the cinema snob to actually review. Um, yeah, so those three being in the hotel room together is a great kind of starting point for this review. Of course, they set up the whole, like, you know, Kyle's the big uh, art film guy. Uh, Paul is the big uh, music guy and the movie kind of... Uh, you know, mixes both. I love, you know, I love how that's the the reason why those two are specifically the people that critic have that the critic has helping him. Of course, Brental Floss as Russell Crowe is amazing in this review. Oh my god! Every time, like with his Captain Crunch hat and the slinkies on his shoulders, it's just oh, it's so good. I love the act so song, like the middle song. One big song, yes. Yeah. Uh, one big song, like. This is by far, I think, the most impressive production that the critics ever put on. I mean, he might have more CG in his later work, and he might have more sets and props in his later work. But the fact that this was all filmed at a convention, and yet it totally has the feel of a musical. You know what I mean? Like, those songs are catchy. Like, they're damn good songs. They need to set more reviews in hotels. really do. They do. They do. Like, Dragon, yeah, as you said, one big song. I mean, that's the most epic lead into a commercial ever. It's amazing. And all the songs have a purpose. Um, you know, I love Linkara's song where he's... Um, he's, you know, he's Anne Hathaway. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I wish I was in this review. I was barely in the Moulin Rouge one. <laughs> oh, man. Also, Moulin Rouge, I think, might be a better critique of the actual movie. 
because I love how the Moulin Rouge review kind of takes on different points of view on the movie and different opinions on the movie. I just think this eclipses Moulin Rouge for just the sheer number of songs and the production values and gags and everything. Uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, of course, I, I love the platypus bunny thing. <laughs> like, wow, this review is taking on more subplots than the actual movie. We don't need any more. Platypus then, bunny! Just, I love the timing of Todd just bursting in. Like, guys, guys, I just saw the most amazing thing. <laughs> like, both Doug and Kyle are just like, nope. Nope, it's a platypus bunny, you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, of course, all the Russell Crowe gags are great. To be honest with you, like, there's one or two gags that they kind of carry over, especially the one where, like, the critics making fun of like the one guy from the Broadway run, and then Kyle's getting really offended about that. Like, as someone who doesn't care or know about the Broadway show, that that those kind of theater jokes sort of go over my head it's kind of like the one weak spot of the review for me but i mean other there's just like so many great shots in this movie like i love the way that they use the uh the opening shot with the calm waterfall like this big kind of pan up to the waterfall and then i love the shot at the end of one big song with a critic in the field and the camera pulling back um of course, I love the Sasha Baron Cohen and Helena Bonham Carter song because it's so goddamn accurate. It's just like, yeah, you see these two and everything. They're professionals. They'll give you your, your money's worth. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's just so many high points with this thing. There's the one big song at the, you know, there's the do you hear the critics sing at the end. And as I said, I just love how many different reviewers they cram into this thing. I love how uh, how Leo, aka that sci-fi guy, is basically like Linkara's assistant, and he keeps interrupting Linkara. Like, I forgot my iPod. <laughs> um, and also it has uh, Maven and Paul are kind of like you know doing that in love thing, which in real life they were dating at the time, so that was all very natural for them to do. Really, um, they were dating? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're still dating. I'm pretty sure they're married now. Oh, yeah. What do you know? <laughs> Anyways, yes, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, guys, like I said, this is definitely number one for me for the fact that it it's it's the point in time. I'm getting like wistful and misty eyed talking about this. Like, oh boy, it's the point in time where I just felt like anything was possible with this website and with. You know, like, even though we had lost a couple people along the way, like Spoonie and Nostalgia Chick, we had new people like Kyle who were kind of taking the reins and, you know, like pulling the side in a new direction. And it just felt so promising and so, and guys, I can, like we already kind of discussed, like the Nostalgia Critic has kind of gone full circle again to now the site is mostly just focused on the critic. Um with no other i mean link car is still on there but other than that you know there's no other real big reoccurring shows i do like well the, blockbuster buster uh, sure i i mean i do like the awesome comic guys especially uh walter benaziak the guy who does uh i i just really like walter benaziak he's probably the the newest person on the site who i've really taken a big liking to uh they do top five lists i love his delivery i love him as you know the flash in the suicide squad review hello well and he's <laughs> ldl well oh uh, right right so um yeah yeah um but like i said man it's i just i miss the days when that guy with the glasses felt like a community it felt like it felt like it was actually worth getting invested into the side reviewers content so that you would you know what I mean? It was almost kind of like a cinematic universe for reviewers in a way where, you know, you, know you, you'd watch the Linkara stuff and you'd even watch the reviews of, I mean, I didn't watch many obscure Sloopa things, you know, but I, well, I watched some Thalys stuff, you know, it's like, and of course the Brad Jones stuff, and then they'd all kind of come together for those anim anniversary movies, which were essentially the Avengers movies. Yep. And I, like I said, this was like, this was filmed at a time where it was post- to boldly flee, it was post the nostalgia critic revival. It was post the Spoonie drama, so it wasn't like the community was perfect. But I think this review was perfect, and I think it's a perfect representation 
of how much fun it was to be involved in this website and to follow all these different personalities and how cathartic it was to see all these different personalities come together for a piece of content. It's just a fucking awesome review. All right, I'm done. <laughs> all right, my number one, uh, the Animaniacs. Yep, Animaniacs. Yep, had a feeling. <laughs> Yep. Good choice. Good choice. So again, honestly, this one again, the only reason this one's uh, above Batman, you know, the, the Batman the animated series uh, top eleven list is, and they're really close. Um, again, they're all very different. This is a tribute. We have tri tribute this top eleven list. And there's a review. It was kind of like top three spots. Uh, this to me was such an. I, every time I think of this one, I always get back is really happy. Kind of this place with it, where it's like it was such a great surprise. Of video and it had it's a basically your equivalent to my Don Bluth thing, right? <laughs> Essentially, yes, in many ways. It was sort of this it, it had the balance I was talking about here. It's kind of the balance of a a kind of like on the I don't want to just this is gonna be a bad comparison say it's mainly Cisco and Eber in terms of the informative quality, but also it's funny to like just just for the top three list of it all I would say, you know, like Batman and Robin. Let's just for more proper comparison, let's say this is like the top eleven Batman animated series meets uh, the Cisco Niebuhr review. Mm -hmm. So it's something very nostalgic, meeting something very informative, which also got some laughs from the Batman view, uh, you know, Batman uh, uh, top 11 list mix there. Point is, it, it, it's funny and it's informative, and it's with you know, the animation greats uh, you know, we've had from the Amblin days, of course, our uh, Ramble Files, if you will. You know, we have. Uh, <laughs> You know, we have Tom Ruger. Of course, a lot of these uh, players not only uh, invested, not only. Uh, Paulson was there, right? Paulson, no. Oh, he wasn't really? Huh. No. I could have sworn he was there. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, it's Tom Ruger, Cherry Stoner, it's uh, John P. McCann, and Paul Rugg, and. Uh, so weird Ru that. I'm sorry, it's so weird that Paulson wasn't there. I could have wasn't sworn there. He was there. Wow, that really throws me off. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Nate ahead. Ruger, uh, the son of, uh, son of Tom Ruger. And of course, uh, yeah, remember these people. Nate uh, Ruger is also the voice of Skippy Squirrel, right? <laughs> yes. And Young Plucky Duck. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, yeah, you have like kind of the hallmarks of a van of the Amblin animated animated works, you know, Tiny Toons. Besides Rob Paulson. Yes, Tiki. Besides Rob Paulson. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, you got the you know, Tiny Toons, <laughs> Maniacs, and of course, my favorite of all of them, which is the reason I really got a kick out of this thing was announced. Well, well, not when it was announced. I they was getting so surprised. Basically. I was thinking like Cisco Neva. Okay, it's going to be in the set. You're talking about Animaniacs. Mm -hmm. It's made seem at the top eleven. Uh, it was like two minutes. Maybe rapid fire for like top eleven audience to Animaniacs shows. Okay, maybe one of those. Maybe like twenty minutes of him like going off. Like, oh yeah, I remember like the Animaniacs was a great show because of these reasons. And he did the opening like hey, it's time for Animaniacs. And the critic just keeps popping up saying, "Yeah, critic." <laughs> and I'm saying, "Okay, <laughs> ain't that cute? Ain't that precious? Those are going to be a fun little." <laughs> and then he's going into and then this corner and then my mom started to be blown here which is he's going through and he's now seeing him and they're in different locations which signals to me could he have somehow edited the 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 dvd interview oh my god this, again i was thinking the tom booth <laughs> thing essentially right could he somehow edit them as he, again his editing prowess like, how good is he <laughs> then of course we see nate ruger it's like okay this is obviously the conversation going with nate nate ruger some, some, this is, oh my god it's live and then like mm. they're one of them is doing like kind of like the champion pose like you shake his hands like yeah yeah and it's like oh my god <laughs> They're live and in, well, semi live and in person. Right. This is a pre this is a pre record. This is a conversation. Eat gad. And I'm watching, being blown away. I'm like, I'm so engrossed. And then I scrolled in. Oh my God, there are two more videos. It's going to be such so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's being jazzed online because not only did I get like, you know, like kind of the heads of these shows. It's, kind, got, of like the, uh, it's kind of like the Incredibles DVD. Like, not only is there a making of documentary, there's literally just more making of. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially just, that. But again, I was so blown away. Oh my God, not only did we get, you know, Tom Rue, kind of the guy who led the charge in a lot of this. And sure, it's not a voice from mm. you know, shows. Uh, you know, we have again John P. McCann and Paul Rugg. I was so jazzed in my mind, I get such a kick out of those guys. Again, those are very much the voices of freaks. So quite literally, with Paul Rugg, he is the voice of freaks. Oh, yeah. but also, oh, yeah. <laughs> again, John P. McCann has that beautiful thing where he don't know if he's if he's ever he's has the best dead pandal. Not not he has the best straight delivery ever. Like, he could tell you the most insane thing and he'd say it with complete sincerity. It's like, oh my god, McCann is so oh he's so brilliant. And he says they and all of them just. You know, jiving kind of, they're sharing these great stories from Animaniacs. You know, we have like, uh, you know, re uh, recording uh, 
Skippy Squirrel. We have you know the fact mm-hmm. that she was uh, the the live action for Ariel. We have again like all the the cart full of Emmys. They actually put all of his Emmys in, in like a giant wheelbarrow and just for for a gag. And we also like you know jokes intercutting. So he was very much in character as a nostalgia critic, while still again giving a very genuine interview and, and discussion with these guys. You know, so it's, it's the best kind of. It's honestly it's kind of the end point you imagine with the nostalgia critic. He's a guy who is mingling with with icons and nostalgia. Like kind of what we have with him now again. Yeah, just again, it's kind of like the this is sort of like the kickback, relax version of of Nesesgrel. He's he's hit the the ceiling of success, and now he's enjoying it. Right, right. So again, overall, the anime series is just, it's such a surprise and still it's so good without even being reviewed. It's that good. It's very, it's incredibly watchable. All right. Okay, Sandy, moment of truth. <laughs> all on you, no pressure. But- we all know how good the first Never Ending Story movie is. <laughs> we all know how absolutely horrible the third movie is. <laughs> That's the one I chose. Because um, the, the, the critic has expressed his love and his passion for... Uh, Artex! 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 Yes, the, the, the first movie. and uh, do, uh, Dragon, do you love the first movie? Take you do you love the first movie? Honestly, I'm guessing no. So, right? No? Okay. It's okay. I've, I've enjoyed it. I have enjoyed it. It's been, it's been a long time. I don't really go back to it a lot, but I understand the fun. connections to it, to tell you the truth. I've never really watched it all um, the way through. It is it is a very, very good movie. Uh, it, it's a, and As he said, it's a great... It was like the signature, or at least one of the signature kids' movies of the eight, of the uh, early 80s. Was it 1982 mm-hmm. came out? 83? I think it was 82. Uh, anyways. Yeah, it was early 80s. Um, the third one is just, uh, it's just, it, it's just an abomination. It's a complete, uh, spit in the face to, uh, what made the first movie so great. Of course, you know, the, the second movie is horrible, but you know, this is basically, the third movie is basically just a, the, the second movie amped up about 10 notches and <laughs> well, why I chose this is because it just, it just, it just goes to show how far the critic will take things. You know, at the end of the review, he literally, he drives to Home Depot. He goes inside. He gets a crow. He buys remember, a crow. Remember what sets him off. Yeah, it, it, yes, the, the, the credit song. It's, uh, what was it that? He just, loves the end credits music they play for, for the never-ending story. And the, the, <laughs> yeah, for the... I'm still looking forward to one positive thing from this terrible movie. Yeah, and he doesn't get it, and he's deprived of the, <laughs> deprived of that one positive feeling, oh, that reward. Man. With the worst moment for the for him in the whole review, and that's <laughs> I, I love that. I, I gotta, you gotta. That's just like the that's like cosmic justice here. Like the worst moment of the review that causes him the most pain, then comes back to him as the one moment he's, he's anticipating just some like mercy of relief. And, like, and that's how you get to finish it off. That's how you get to finish this movie yeah. off. Anyway, so he goes to Home Depot, buys a crowbar, drives back home laughing the entire time, <laughs> throws the movie on the ground, just beats the ever-living crap Like it was Jason Todd, the crap just, out of this thing with a crowbar. Just, he's smashing it to bits, he's ripping the case apart, he's spitting on it, he's raping trampling it. it, and then he basically just ends off just this, just this mangled... Mess of a man saying, "Nostalgia <laughs> <laughs> critic," uh, and then he, he, he. I watched it today. What did he say? It was uh, um, welcome. What's well, one down? It's, 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 a, it's the beginning of sequel. Sequel month, yes. <laughs> one oh, down, wow. and then he just walks off. It's like oh, you the fact that that's guy. the first one. He really blew his well in the first one. My God, but he still kept <laughs> well, I mean, it going. To be also did uh, Timmy to the rescue during that, so oh, you know, he still had some good ones to go. <laughs> Oh yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. That's that's basically wow. it. And one thing I realized while uh, while watching the review is, uh, at the end, the uh, Jack Black's character, he he's wearing glasses at the end of the film because he gets turned into a bookworm. He's wearing glasses and he looks like R.L. Stein from Goosebumps. Oh my god! So they, that's like the young R.L. Stein. I sent that to Bjorn, and he was like, "Oh my gosh!" The yes. Origin of R.L. Stein. Oh man, that's great. <laughs> Most ridiculous origin known to man. One thing. This is this is kind of off topic, though. But still relating to the critic. One one movie I think he should review, or at least consider reviewing, is The Last Unicorn, which 
I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. I have seen that, yes. yeah. My sister has more of a connection to it than I do, but yeah, I know of it. I really have no connection to it. I mean, I've watched it a few times when I was little, you know, but I honestly Brian's I think that's one of... Brave Little Toaster, has he? I don't think so. I think he's touched on it once or twice, but I don't think he's yeah. ever... Yeah, like, I know that's one of the video. I know that's one of the reviews that he said he'd never do. Like, he did a top 11 things he'd never do and that was on it and that made me really sad because i think the brave little toaster is just tailor-made for critic i think he also had it i know he used the clip if he didn't have it in like the top 11 like scariest nostalgic moment oh, I'm sure it was moments. in there somewhere you know the, yeah. you know, the, the clown scene oh, oh yeah i think I, uh, the last unicorn is one of those obscure things that not everyone knows about but you could totally pick it apart and um pull out all the uh different flaws and there's 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 a ton of things wrong with it makes really it makes no sense but um I, I, I like i i've never really seen the brave little toaster i've probably seen like a sequel or something but it, it it feels like it would suit the critic and his uh his love for obscure animated films bad animated films well with the well. brave little toaster the fucking sequels are on netflix but the original movie isn't it which pisses me off well the reason he's probably not going to talk about it is because it's really good yeah, I know, but there's still a lot of things to dissect about it. But anyway, that's true. Anyways, I'm done. Okay, guys, I think for the final statements, I want to go round table and say two things. Number one, what the critic means to us. Number two, what direction we hope the critic goes in in the future. And of course, make it as quick as we can because already this is already long. But uh, as I said, guys, what the critic means to me personally. Um, it's it's just the sense of community like that's always always been what i've strived to do with this channel i've strived to you know to bring in new people like you know like sandy like you and jacob are people that were not around in the early days of the channel but you have become like absolutely pivotal members of the channel you well, know I, what i mean yeah i've been here for pretty long though i mean no, I know, but you weren't here from the beginning. Like, oh, yeah, that's the very like beginning. Adventure Blue Dude or Monkey was. Yeah, that's true. Um, and even Monkey wasn't here from the very beginning, but I digress. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so like I said, I just, it's that sense of community and the whole, you know, like, like these people working together to create something. And I just think it's sad nowadays because there's been so much behind the scenes drama. There's been so many people who have left the site over the years. I know uh, I know there was a big kind of uh, falling out with a lot of creators when Obscurus Lupa got fired from the site. I know that that was like a big controversy I don't even want to touch on because it involves some, uh, let's just say, some not-so-flattering claims from both parties on that issue. Um, but like I said, I just – I really do – I just give the critics so much, uh, I, I give Doug so much credit for, uh, even if it didn't last, that sense of, you know, like watching people's videos and getting invested into their personalities and getting invested into their senses of humor and the running jokes. And it wasn't just the critic. It was people like Linkara, people like Film Brain, who I really miss and I wish Film Brain would go back to doing bad movie beatdowns. Um, you know, people like the Cinema Stop, people like Angry Joe. I, I mean, it's just a, like a long list. Todd in the Shadows. Uh, you know, just a long, long list of people who were just great on that site. And some of them didn't stay on the site for very long. Some of them are still on the site to this day. But it just created this, you know, this great kind of like coming and going of different talent and different ideas and even different genres and different mediums that these reviewers would talk about. I mean, they... <laughs> You know, like the shark jumping people are to, are uh, you know they're they're one of the last talented content creators left on the site, you know who are kind of relatively new. You know, like in shark jumping, of course, is one of the first shows on the site to exclusively talk about TV. Now, in terms of what I want the critic to do, um, I mean, I genuinely like. I kind of enjoyed the Wonder Woman review for what it was, but in spite of that, I just, I really think the critic needs to stop doing these reviews of movies that are still in theaters. I think it's yeah. ridiculous. I think it's, it's like, it's something that it's so easy to criticize, right? 
Exactly, because every, that's what everyone's doing, and I mean it's it's hot and it's fresh on the stove, so you want. No, no, more. no. I'm saying I'm saying Doug doing these movies in the first place is easy to criticize. It's easy to criticize Doug doing it, like he's opening the oh. door to criticism. I feel like it's like he's like not even like I don't know. I honestly think ten years should be the gap. Like ten years should be the limit. Like it shouldn't be nineties because obviously he's covered a huge gambit of ninety. I, I, I mean, I'd like for him to go back and kind of mine some more nineties movies, but I, I mean, there aren't too many that he hasn't covered by now. Um, like Small Soldiers was one of the ones that I really wanted him to do for a long time, and he finally did it, and it was okay. You know, I had so, I I wanted to do that for so long. I was disappointed with the end result. Yeah, yeah, I was too. Anyways, um, I want the critic to focus on, like I said, like I think he should kind of have an. I, I really do think his focal point should be the, the two thousands now because that's the era where he came from, and that's the era that is nostalgic. And I think there's a shit ton of two thousands movies that he hasn't touched yet. A shit ton of them and they are legitimately nostalgic um you know like i don't i don't even know off the top of my head man there's so many i i, I think he should do Stuart a little he hasn't done that yet oh uh, yeah right it's something like a uh, snow dogs kind of comes to yeah. mind yeah um <laughs> you know just there's so many there's so many 2000s movies that you do uh-huh or, you know, I think Stuart Little, Stuart Little Two is, I think, be even, even better candidate because it's <laughs> they both have their ups and downs, but I think this, this second one is by far the worst. Right. Um. So yeah, I just I really want Doug to kind of like nail down an actual time frame for the nostalgia critic stuff because if he doesn't, then it's like, what the hell is the point of even calling it nostalgia critic anymore if you're going to review Wonder Woman? It's like no one, like no one even has any sort of nostalgia for Wonder Woman, obviously, because it's still well, in theaters. I mean, nostalgia for the character. Do you? Okay, look, I understand that that's something that he kind of uses as like a, like a crutch. Like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm talking about the nostalgia for it. Fuck that. But that's a fucking scapegoat. <laughs> that's a fucking scapegoat. And you know it, Dragon. You know that's a scapegoat. All right. I, I like. I don't even want to hear that. It's, Seventy-five years. That's nostalgic. Shut up. Just shut up. It's I don't know. Um I think the critic needs to use his actors a little better. And I don't exactly know how, because there's some there's some points where the critic uses his actors and it's really good, and then other points where the actors just feel like they're just unnecessary to the review. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if you have a review where the actors just kind of pop up for a cameo and then it's the critic most of the time. I think, honestly, part of what kind of drags modern critics down a lot of the times is that he's looking for things for the actors to do when really he should just fo be focusing on the movie. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's really about I, it. Re regarding that, I think everything should just tie together nothing should be you know forced in you know you have, uh -huh. you have you have a script you shouldn't have to force characters in it should all just kind of come together naturally exactly i mean like I, like, like 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 cat in the hat that all came together very naturally right and uh lay miz as well lay miz came together incredibly well um, and so son of the mask mm -hmm. i mean and I mean, I think at this point it's a pipe dream to have that same sense of community back, what I was talking about with Liam is and everything. I really wish they'd try harder, though. I really wish they would try harder because at this point with the content that they do put on the channel, it's basically just like, hey, look at the stuff that we like from YouTube. I mean, you know, when Chris Stuckman joined the joined channel awesome, I was like... Chris Stuckman is already such an established presence on YouTube. There's literally zero point for Stuckman to be on Channel Awesome. It's just he's just there because he's popular and because Channel Awesome's popular. So it's mutually beneficial, you know. I, I really wish we'd go back to, uh, you know, taking people like the Shark Jumping People and the Blockbuster Buster and... Uh, you know, and like Walter Benaziak and the awesome comics people. I really want to see that sort of community cross over more. And I realize it's hard. And I realize that it's like that that crossing over kind of caused some of the drama to begin with. But 
man, I just, I, I just, I, guys, I can't even tell you. Like, like I said, I literally get misty eyed remembering what it used to be like to be a fan of that guy with the glasses and to know all the contributors and everything. So that's it. That's my piece. This is already going on way too long. So be quick with it, guys. <laughs> um, I guess just briefly, the status quo always boils down to the very simple premise. It's, it's a guy in front of a, this guy going through a movie and they have like, you know, someone very vested in the 90s getting very, very worked up over very, uh, in the grand scheme, sorry, I was trying to find the words here. It's, it's someone just very ingrained in nostalgia, voicing, you know, uh, voicing kind of how things don't hold up as well, but also can, could be better in the 90s, how we were a little bit easily impressed back then. Now we have a little bit of foresight. And it, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, well-edited reviews, very simple. It's like you know, a guy in front of a camera, which a lot of people replicated that style. I think he did it uh, very much the best way, best way you could. Uh, back then, we've just built on from there going forward with the with nostalgia creatures. To me, it will always be that. Just, you know, it's the guy very passionately talking about movies, and you have, like, these fun fun gags here and there. And, like, the over... Basically, again, we we have a very Looney Tunes take with the over you know, with the overreactions. Again, Kinnison meets Looney Tunes with the most parts of the guy. You know, the guy with a you know, tie, hat, jacket, and a gun. That's that's nostalgia critic to me. That's, 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 you know, again, you see mainly... To me, nostalgia critics, you know, it's from the... From the you know, from the from the waist up, I guess that's the South Creek to me. Got a table, mm -hmm. and I like, you know, I'm not saying like you know, when we do like the anniversary. I always have fondness for the anniversary stuff, of course, and I'd, I'd like us to get to that point again. I, I doubt it, but I'm saying you know, it's be funny be... because like the blockbuster buster is someone that we both cite as like a good content creator, and he came like right after to boldly flee, so he barely missed out on that anniversary stuff. Mm -hmm. I would love to see him in an anniversary movie. I'm with you. I'm I'm right there with you. And of course, you know those anniversaries were the gateway to other things like midnight screenings. With you know, for me, it was always it's always midnight screenings with uh, with Brad Jones and the you know, cinema. That's snob. pretty much the only thing I watch from Brad as well. I'm not really interested exactly. in the cinema snob because of just the the content. But yeah, occasionally yeah, I watch know, something like from cinema snob, like the uh, Kurt Cameron Saving Christmas. I watched that review and that was great. Right. But anyways, go ahead. And, you know, like Link Car and a few others. You know, basically things that, looking for reviews that popped out to me versus, like, you know, the whole catalog, what they got. It doesn't really, doesn't really work as well. So, dude, the sense where you watch anyone, even if you weren't familiar with the movie, you still kind of get, like, again, a good summation of the movie along with, Along with you know jokes, just seeing how ridiculous it is, and it kind of is. It, the Sasquatch has always been a great introduction to pop culture. In terms of what I'd like to see from in the future, again, personally, I like to see him go back to the original format. I know they had kind of a fourth wall joke in the uh, in the Suicide Squad. I don't know how intentional it was. I think if they're smart, it was a fourth wall joke saying, you know, people sitting at a desk. You know, people. Yeah, people, what people want to see is people sitting at a desk, which might have been like a little fu to the fans a little bit, saying, hey, you don't like. It. Look at all this studio and all this. Look at how great. Look at all the stuff we have now. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how, how direct that was because Goodman was talking about the opening of Suicide Squad. They're all sitting at a you know desk eating, you know you know eating the steak and you know going over the files and stuff. I'd like to get away from that again. Like getting away from the current reviews. I'm on I'm on board with you, Tiki. However, I will say the Suicide Squad compare was the only successful and they've really truly successful one they've had out of all those. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll agree with that. But I mean, aside from that, again, I'd say, I I want them to I want them to not be so current with it. At the same time, though, there are a few gags. I mean, we we did a few gags. I like to see. That's all I can really uh, speculate on. In terms of like a full blown review, I'd like to see. You know, a uh, movie Tig and I have seen and enjoyed Twas the Night. That'd be fun to see. God, right. You know, Brian Cranston TV Christmas movie. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun you know to what? see. I wouldn't be surprised if at one point he did uh, the Disney Channel original movies as a Disney December. Okay, I could buy that too. Because yeah, I mean, that, he, look, like, let's face it, he's stretching for content on December, so <laughs> exactly. So that's probably yeah, he'll probably go there. You're right. He'll probably uh -huh. uh, get there at some point. Uh, just a few observations I had, just getting you know, kind of reflecting on ten years in Sash Creek is that uh, you know, I, I the uh, the Wicker Man review, uh, there, uh, the Wicker Man review had Tamara in it, uh, which was an early one. Tamara, uh, she looked identical the way she looked in that review to Claire from House of Cards, Robin Wright's character from House of Cards. I wish they'd utilize that because oh my god, I was watching. It. I forgot how much she looked like Claire when she's all smiling and stuff and the, acting all polite. It's like oh my god, that's identical to the professional, yet dangerous Claire Underwood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we 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 did pay this off. It was unsatisfying. Malcolm just is a fantastic asset that the Statue has acquired in the years that he was like a fantastic addition. 
again, maybe too many skits, but when we do have skits, as much as they do seem out of place, a lot of the time they do, they are a lot of fun. Like when he's Gus, he's perfect Gus Fring. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, they finally, I, I've been ever since Malcolm joined, I've always said he looks exactly like Gus from from Psych. And they did one gag about Psych. Unfortunately, it was like a really hate-filled gag about Psych. Come on, that's a that's a last you know Lassiter's played by hey, Timothy O'Munson. We love Timothy O'Munson. Oh, why you gotta <laughs> why you gotta crap on Psych? And that, you know, like they finally acknowledge after all these years with Malcolm's like ah, and you you, you just. You mock it. Why? <laughs> anyway, so just in general, it was a nice to see in the future. And again, so just get back to the older format a little. Yeah, it's, it's slowly, I guess, but just get there. That's all I can really say going forward. All right, Sandman. Uh, I'm just going to make this short and sweet. I, I agree with you guys. I think he, he really should make a uh, – just the time frame. You know, I, I think 10 years is is really fair. And I think mm -hmm. the the, the – the, the amount of movies from the, the late 90s, I'd say probably like 1998, 1999 to early 2000s, I'd say that's a great starting point. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly, I I started watching The Critic back... He should review Chicken Little. He should, shouldn't he? I mean, I know he's already done a Disney December on it, but that movie has more than enough material for a full-blown critic review. Yeah. Anyways. Um. I, I have been watching the critics since like probably 2012, so though I, I really wasn't around for you know. Got you beat by more than a few years, kid. So what? I said I've got you beat by more than a few years. Oh yeah, I know. I so I, I was about to say so I wasn't around for you know the, the, all the big community stuff, but I definitely see where oh, all this man, kind of stuff. You missed is. out. You missed out. Oh well, god. Watching his his older videos, so I think it would be great to bring uh, bring that stuff back and uh, just you know. Having uh, all of, of his his content just in you know like we were talking about earlier, just have uh, his actors and all that uh, great skit stuff um, he he used to do so well. Just have that all come back together nicely. I've really been avoiding his his latest stuff, like his latest reviews, like Wonder Woman's you know uh, Jurassic World, whatever what would it be? But because I I feel like. I, I'm pretty much on the same page. I feel like the nostalgia critic, you know, you have to do nostalgia stuff. You can't just, you know, say, oh, it's about the characters. You know, it's about the original movies. I hate to use this term, but him doing stuff like Wonder Woman is basically selling out. It, well, it's what it feels like. Be the, that, that, slightly positive. What, what? I, think, I, th I think, yeah, pandering and selling, I think both of those are, are, are good, uh, mm. um, a good, um, good words to use because it's, it's it's honestly what it feels like and that's why i haven't been watching a lot of his recent stuff mostly just you know going back when i do watch critic and he's going back and watching his old stuff it's mm. great but yeah I, I i look forward to where he's going and i hope he can uh pull himself and pull himself out of where he currently is and uh, get himself back up on his feet in a healthy place and uh Make everyone happy, or try the be the best he can. Make his viewers happy. Okay. All right, guys. Well, this podcast comes in at just shy of three hours long, but you know what? <laughs> Fuck it. We have so many memories of the critic, and like I said, it's it's come to that full circle place where the nostalgic critic has himself become nostalgic for me. Huh. Like I, I, he was a big part of my like you know my late teenage years. Like you know like. What junior? He's reached his own cutoff. Ten like, years. I know, right? Like he was a big part of like my junior and senior year of high school, like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Like uh, Dragon, I'm with you. Like I've, you know, like I, I haven't necessarily met friends through Critic, but I've like bonded with people through Critic. Like it might not be our meeting point, but it'll. It's like definitely something that's very mutual. Um. So yeah, folks. Like I said, just just thank you for watching and. Uh, <laughs> And two damn again next time on List Media, the show where we wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tune in next time, folks, where we'll uh, we'll round up and rank again. A back credit card. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs>